Okay, um, let's uh, bring this meeting to order. Uh, let's uh, start out the November 9th, 2023 uh, Board of Directors meeting. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the agenda as published, please? So moved. Second. Seconded. Thank you. All in favor? Students, please. Aye. And directors? Aye. 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 That's uh, 2050 to approve the agenda. And <clears throat> we will move to Fred for recognitions. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to begin, begin with our student representatives who are here tonight um, and ask them to come to the podium. Uh, coming to the podium is Chloe Yang and Zach Saeed. And they're here tonight uh, with a presentation to us, but I think tonight's a great night to have them here because it was a collaborative effort with our elementary schools as well. Um, so let me talk a little bit about um, their work near and far, thinking about global citizenry and how do we give back to our communities near and far. So last year, MIHS juniors Chloe Yang and Zach Saeed led a WASH, which is a water sanita sanitation and hygiene <clears throat> program in Sokpoi Village, a remote community in Ghana. As part of the program, Chloe, Zach, and a group of volunteers introduced students and teachers of Sokpoi Presby School to a series of children's books designed to teach reading skills and acquisition. They guided them in identifying the sounds of letters and how to form some basic words. They also engaged the students in a hand washing exercise and while some team members demonstrated how germs are quickly spread using silver glittering paper, others enlightened them on the need to always wash their hands before eating, after using the washroom, and after playing in the mud. Also part of the WASH project, Chloe and other volunteers were exposed to varied skills needed to construct a three unit washroom for a school. This group engaged in the molding of cement blocks, plastering, and painting works. This group of volunteers took a ride to a local market, had a hands-on lesson in pottery instruction on tie-dye making, palm wine tapping, and palm oil production. And through the generous support from families at our four elementary schools, Chloe and Zach were able to collect over 350 pounds of gently used school supplies to distribute to the Soap Boy Village and also many other villages in the Volta region of Ghana. They work with Adanu, an NGO in distributing the supplies. Adanu, along with the Sokpoi village, sent a kente scarf as a thank you in recognition of the support from the families in the Mercer Island School <coughs> District. And so tonight to present the scarf and hopefully tell us a little bit more about their project, their journeys, and what they learned are Chloe and Zach. So welcome. Thank you so much. Well, I would just like to start out with thanking <laughs> Dr. Rundle, as well as the Mercer Island School Board for this opportunity. Um, at the end of the 2020 school year, I, along with Zach, were able to hold a school supply drive at the four elementary schools and collect 350 pounds of school supplies, as you said. Um, and with that, we were able to donate all of that to the Volta region, um, to schools across the Volta region. Um, and I think that was really eye-opening, not only for us, but also for everyone involved in the project because students in Ghana typically you know, go to school without any school supplies. Many of them sit in the back of the classroom if they don't have pencils, papers, erasers, and are really disengaged um, in the lesson if they aren't properly equipped with you know, what they need for school. So I think that um, this effort, it was really a community effort that really helped the Subpoy community, and it was just a great project to see. Yeah, I thought it was it was such a great experience just to go out there, see what it's like to live in Ghana, and then like also get to experience the culture there, which is super interesting. And I felt honestly it was really awesome to like, build something meaningful there, like help build the washroom and help you know create this you know environment where everyone can learn and everyone's prepared to learn. And it was really awesome to just you know see what it's like there. I guess the most eye-opening thing for me was that school supplies, like a bundle of school supplies for the entire year for students there would cost typically two dollars and families can't even afford that. So I think with all the school supplies that 
the Mercer Island School District donated, it'll definitely help hundreds, um, possibly thousands of students in Ghana. So on behalf of Adanu, um, we would like to present the Mercer Island School District with this kente scarf. Awesome. Um, So why don't we take a picture with our board and we'll hold this up and have the two of you with our with our board right up there. Yeah, right in there though. We all sorry. So we'll need someone behind so need to be able to see it. So it's a little tight. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, a perfect. Okay. Three, two, one. Okay. Mom, you want to do that? You got it? Yeah, they're all looking at you. <laughs> Two, three, can you get one of the bread in there? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. I think what we'll do, and since our principals are here, um, we'll certainly find a way to um, show it probably here in the district office, but what I'd like to do is be able to if you travel to school to school to school to school so that the schools can also be part of that. And I don't know, we might incorporate or, or call on you to maybe come give presentations or something there. So thank you so much. <laughs> um, some other recognitions. <clears throat> I want to uh, take a moment and recognize our Executive Director of Finance and Operations. Um, he doesn't know this is going to happen, but I do want to point out something um, that I think is really important that shows our investment, not just in our own community, um, but across our county. So we, recently we received a letter that said, uh, and this was from Dow Constantine, uh, I'm pleased to report to you, to the King, or pleased to reappoint you, Matt Sullivan, to the King County Investment Pool Advisory Committee filling the elected official or employee of a school district position for the remainder of the two-year term expiring in 2025. Your, appoint your appointment is subject to confirmation by King County Council. As you know, membership of a King County Board of Commissions is an excellent way to become an active participant in the decision-making process of the county government. King County boards and commissioners are examining many ways uh, and vital issues that face our county today. As a member of the investment pool, you have had the opportunity to help maintain and improve the quality of life in King County. So congratulations, Director Sullivan. Thank you. Um, some other uh, recognitions. Uh, I want to recognize uh, tomorrow. Uh, obviously, it's a day off of school, but um, hopefully not just a complete day off. We have Veterans Day. Um, which is a great opportunity, unlike Memorial Day and, and others, to really think about the veterans and those who served. And I had a chance to be at Island Park yesterday for their um, Veterans Day assembly. Um, Lakeridge's was today. I imagine yours was today. I think it was at West. They saw in the newsletter and, and Northwood as well. And um, I think what is, I mean, what stands out for me when, whenever we have these assemblies is just the pride in these kids who get to talk about aunts, uncles, grandparents, neighbors, friends, um, and they get a chance to share in their own words. But we got a chance to meet a former uh, Top Gun Navy pilot um, who's the grandfather of one of our students. And uh, he was quick to point out that we'd all be happy to know they don't spend all their time on the beach playing volleyball, <laughs> uh, that they actually work really hard and that's not part of the routine. Um, so. Uh, uh, it was a, a great uh, event, and I know all the schools are doing those, so thanks for uh, modeling that for our students. We have Diwali coming up this weekend. Um, it's uh, several days, but Sunday is uh, the big event um, for our families 
uh, of the Hindu faith. We also have next week National Education Support Professionals Day, and that is on the 15th. I oftentimes think back to some of the districts I worked in um, prior to Mercer Island, and I couldn't believe how many paraprofessionals and other support staff we have in our district compared to other places that I've been a, a part of. Next Friday is uh, Substitute Education Day, and I know our, we're constantly working on filling positions for subs. Um, we had a training not too long ago and brought in 20 new subs to our district. Um, we're always looking for others to come in to help uh, fill in when our staff can't be there. So those are my recognitions. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> with that, we've got some public input today. So we will move to that. Uh, Jessica Clausen, please. And I will just read a disclaimer quickly before I give you your three minutes. Uh, the, the meeting is a meeting of the board and public. It's not a public meeting that guarantees interaction between members of the public and members of the board. When addressing the board at the meeting, please limit your remarks to not more than three minutes, appoint a spokesperson if the concern is a group concern, and if desired, provide written documentation to the board secretary. Public comments that name or otherwise identify a district student are not permitted without permission of the student's guardian. The board may direct the superintendent to respond at a later date to the issues expressed. Uh, with that, Jessica, please uh, provide your input to the board. Great, thank, thank you. you. Uh, my name is Jessica Clausen. I'm a parent of a student at Island Park. Um, and I'm also a member of the facilities uh, committee. And I'm the sole member of the facilities committee that voted no against the plan. So I'm very excited to see the discussion that you're going to have tonight. Um, related to the policy not to consolidate. That was my position as well. Um, I just want to make a few observations about the process as somebody who was part of it. Um, thank you to Dr. Rundle for running a good process. Um, at the end, you know, there, there wasn't, and uh, Director Blowitz was there quite a bit, um, uh, but uh, there weren't as many people there as we started with, so the actual plan was voted on by probably like 15 of the committee members. Um, it just kind of petered out. They, they were quite long meetings. It was a long process. Um, but it seemed like we got to the consolidation issue very quickly. All of a sudden, consolidation became a thing, and all of a sudden, it was Close Island Park. And it seemed like we were trying to solve bigger district problems by closing Island Park. And I would suggest that you know we should probably, and I think you all are doing this right now, just looking at your agenda, um, look at the bigger problems and how we can solve those rather than trying to solve those problems with closing an elementary school. So, you know, it doesn't really solve the school funding issue that I know is a state issue. Um, hopefully we can work together with many districts to go tackle that. Um, closing Island Park also wouldn't fix traffic on Island Crestway. Um, I would suggest actually that renovating or reconfiguring Island Park um, would do a better job of fixing that problem. And it doesn't fix the enrollment issue that we face, um, you know, talking to families who have left and figuring out how we can get them back and then also just, you know, increasing enrollment however we can by supporting other policies in the city, zoning policies, etc. Um, I would suggest that's a better way of fixing things rather than closing an elementary school. So in closing, thank you for all of your work and your consideration of this and thank you for listening to the parents. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And I think that was all the public input we have, unless anybody else? No? All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will be addressing this later on. And I think the... Uh, I will listen. Yeah, I the, 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 the story is over. <laughs> uh, let's move on to Superintendent's Report to uh, see. Great, thank you. Um, want to just thank the board for starting tonight's meeting uh, a little bit late. Um, we had an excellent uh, event to celebrate the life of Jennifer Wright uh, after or from four o'clock on up at the high school tonight. Um, especially want to thank uh, Noah Williams and Parker Bixby. Uh, the band who played uh, afterward was a, a great touch. But you know, as I was reflecting and thinking about it, she, she came to the district in 93 and left in 2018. Um, and so tonight's event had all of these educators, um, and there were some from across the region who she worked with, I know through um, our work with, uh, um, with other districts, but just to think about these educators who were probably there from the, you know, 70s and 80s into the early 90s, 
and then those who are here today and the, the bridge that she um, that she created in her career was uh, fantastic. So it was a great stroll down memory lane. Uh, saw a lot of faces that I haven't seen uh, and it's indicative of her bringing people together. So thanks for starting a little late tonight. Um, on a couple of things, just to um, highlight, uh, you know, I, I know that our counseling department um, and, and uh, Principal Wold and I have talked about ways that we might be able to uh, talk a little bit more about counseling when we go for our site visit, we'll have a chance to, but um, we've had turnover, but with that, I am really impressed and excited about some of the changes um, for the better that we're really seeing in our counseling department. Um, they've launched a new, a new newsletter that parents should hopefully have seen um, with some excellent information, but we also have the hub. Um, which uh, our staff has embraced and that's really become a college and career readiness center for our students and just wanted to share a couple things um, on November 4th uh, our one of our uh, leaders from the hub uh, educator took students from our black student union to attend the uh, Seattle Black College Expo at Rainier Beach High School uh, the event is held in cities across the country um, and our BSU students had the opportunity to meet with college admissions officers from many of the HBCU schools, uh, WSU, UW, Seattle Central, UNLV, uh, San Jose. Um, the advisors were able to connect with admi uh, admissions officers from our school. Um, and then I started talking a little bit more to them about, you know, events like this and what do we have planned. And, just to see that you know over 200 colleges and universities have made their way through through our high school already this year, and we're posting those on social media. I know uh, Ian does a great job of helping uh, with the community on those, but really thinking about engagement and how do we engage and build partnerships with colleges and universities, um, and not just expect them to come to us, but how do we go to them? So I just wanted to commend the work that's happening in our um, counseling department to really think about ways um, to help um, with our students. Um, and with that, um, I'm gonna kind of wrap it up there because the real um, show tonight are our elementary principals um, and uh, we're gonna bring them up. So I'll wrap up my comments there and, and just say that I hope everyone has a great Veterans Day, um, a great Diwali celebration um, and on with the agenda. Thank you, Fred. Report. Uh, let's... Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Um, you know, when you said that the counselor, there's a lot of transition. I'm just curious what kind of, is it the nature of the job that we carry at, and it's kind of um, a job that people stay for two years and they move forward? Is it something structurally and the amount of kids that they're seeing that are used to it? Like, what are some of the big problems? Um, yes, 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 I'm not. It, it, it is, seems to be a new frontier right now. Um, I can speak as a parent um, of a high school in, in Issaquah School District where um, my senior had three different, well, now freshman in college, had three different counselors during his tenure in, the high, in his high school. <clears throat> I think we are seeing more turnover. I think it's attributed to um, the complexity of our students and our student needs. Um, as they've evolved, I think it's some of the pressure of um, you know the high stakes nature of not just high school, but now getting into colleges and some of the pressure with that. I think that there is continued to be a funding issue in terms of all of our, um, Jessica spoke to it as well, in terms of how are we funding our schools? Do we have enough counselors? I feel fortunate that a lot of our mental health um, focus is supported by YFS, but I think it's a number of things, Director Dan, and I think those are the things that, that Principal Wold and I have talked about wanting to kind of bring forward in almost a study session or something later on to talk to the board more about, but um, students, I mean, you're working with counselors um, all the time, and you know, maybe you have perspectives too. Yeah, I mean, like, I've been a new counselor every year of high school, and I think like a lot of it, it's like when I talk to someone like Susie Brown and stuff, she just says that like they're not really doing like the work or like that they wanted to do, like coming out of school to be like a counselor. Like they're helping kids with their schedule and like moving them into all these AP classes, but I don't feel like they feel like they're making like that much of a difference in these kids' lives, I guess, and they don't feel like 
Because, like, they kind of, like, kids kind of, like, not use them, but, like, only really go to them for, like, like, to move their classes around, and they're not really making, like, so many, like, connections, I guess, with the students. And also, they just have so many students that it's hard to make connections when you have, like, that many students, I guess. Yeah, and I agree, like, um, there's also been, like, a huge problem of, like, students, um, like, redoing their courses after registration. So, like, oftentimes the calendars are really overloaded, so that might contribute to them feeling overwhelmed, yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious, because, you know, we use the word a counselor very broadly, right? Mm -hmm. Can oftentimes, there, the, I, I, I hear, like, three different tasks, uh, scheduling, uh, providing support, information referral, making an impact, all those. So one thing is, like, how do we make sure we have, we're hiring the right type of professionals for the tasks that we're asking them to do, so that, you know, when they come in, they, otherwise, we'll continue to face these problems. Mm -hmm. And sometimes one person don't like all those things, right? They might be good in one thing and not in the other thing. So, yeah. Good. No, no, I, I, I agree with Tam. It sounds like that perhaps, like, a, as you suggested, a deeper dive in terms of, you know, if you want to think slightly differently about the positions within counseling to sort of align better with student expectations and perhaps shifts in how counselors are utilized. Well, and I think, you know, the position that's kind of leading the hub was uh, MIEA and MISD working together. I know that Director Battersby, um, through negotiations, they had a lot of conversations of, about ways to support counseling, and that was one of the solutions, was to have someone who could help coordinate that a little bit more and be more focused on that so our counselors can work in other areas. Clearly, we've got a lot of things to do, um, but I am grateful for, you know, the movement forward, and, and, and I think that team um, is continuing to try to commit to different ways to do things, so. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move to 3A, Board Policy 1800 OE10, Instructional Program Elementary School Improvement Plans. Oh, you promote you. Julie's on. Her, she's here. Which school was one to go first? I'll go first. I okay, <laughs> I just want to be trying to so as our uh, elementary team uh, comes up, I, I, one of the reflections I have for them uh, and that I shared with them candidly is, you know, I've seen these evolve over time. I've seen them evolve when I was in the chair um, and then subsequently. And what I continue to be impressed with with our current um, cohort of, of principal leaders is just the, the use of data and really trying to think about um, how they can get not just at a class level or a school level, but all the way down to the student level. And while the school improvement plan can't necessarily talk to the student level for confidentiality, when I sit down with them in their, their offices and happen to be at John's school yesterday, but make my way through all of them, and for him to pull up on his screen and we're talking about individual kids and the teachers who are working with that, um, it's pretty remarkable. So I think the other piece before I turn it over to you, uh, Megan, is uh, the way that you continue to balance and think about all students in your plans and that it's not just about one group or, or another, but thinking about the needs of all your learners. A school improvement plan is tough because there's a lot there's a lot of things you're doing that aren't in there, um, but the way that you've uh, really thoughtfully thought about this. So turn it over to you, Megan. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not really loving the Bronco tie, but we'll <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I converted Jennifer Wright to be a Bronco fan. I'm ready for my next person. <laughs> okay, no, I'm just for now. Um, thank you for having us this evening. Uh, Megan Isaacson, Principal Wes Mercer. Um, I think my reflection and my improvement plan will kind of be blended together because they really go hand in hand. Um, this is my third year at West, and I came in really trying to think longitudinally around improvement plans because now it's we've just been building forward every year. Um, of course, the data changes, and we've made adjustments to what we're doing. But in terms of like our focus in particular, before I got to West. Um, there was so much focus on literacy, which is wonderful, and we, we love teaching reading and writing, and 
Yes, we still do. Um, but the levels that we were seeing in math, um, we're not up to that same par. So um, that's the focus that we've had academically the last three years. Um, and each year we get better and better about what that looks like. Um, this past year, it was fortunate that we had the opportunity to shift over to iReady and have the level of assessment data that we do. Um, our K2s last year were still um, obviously in our older curriculum and didn't have that level of data, but essentially what we were then able to look at was how can students grow in a year's time? What percentage of growth are they making in a way that we hadn't been able to before? Um, and last year, we had focused specifically in on domains that were essential core domains that each grade level saw they needed to work on. And, and that was important, but what we found in reflecting on it going into this year was that when we looked at the broader picture across all the domains, specifically too, because our, our curriculum's spiraling around and we're returning it to so many times in the same you know, content area, if you broaden out and we're taking data all along, we can really see students' progress over time. So we kind of shifted from the domain-specific focus this year to the progress measure. Every kid should be making a year's growth or more in a year's worth of time, period. That's like baseline. Um, we know that for every learner that we have, especially because we do have so many students at and above grade level. Every single student deserves that opportunity that when they're in, in class for a whole year, they're learning um, that whole year of growth. And that's why we're really extending out um, as much as we can in our content block and, and within our wolf pack block, which was part of one of the initiatives we had um, started last year, which is the small group intervention and extension <clears throat> period for instruction. Similarly, students who are not yet at grade level need to make more than one year's growth. This is you know, kind of the simple idea, but behind it is we have to start closing gaps for those students, especially those who may be well behind. It's every single year closing that gap. So the focus this year is holistically math, but less on a specific domain and more on every domain all of the time, every day, how are we closing gaps or how are we extending? And so we're really working with um, our coaches, um, the iReady instruction um, directors who come and do professional learning with us, um, and our grade level teams of how are we utilizing the resources we have and pushing students where they need to go and push, pulling students along so that every student in our building has um, just a quality math experience over the year. Um, we did have pretty favorable data overall in terms of our um, SBA and iReady on the school improvement plan or on my reflection actually. You'll see a link to some of those slides and some of the other statistics related to proficiency in the domains from last year. Um, I'm a person who goes straight to what can we do better, you know, so I'm, I'm working on balancing the successes, but I will say in looking at this data, I was, I'm really proud of our teachers. I'm really proud of our team um, and, and what we were able to see with student growth across the grade levels. Um, we had students making, we had a student make 400% year's growth in a year where 100% is the growth. Like that's the type of level of progress. I know that's a bit of an outlier, but we were seeing well above 100% of a year's growth in a year's time for many, many students. And for those not making yet 100% of a year's growth in a year's time, they're already our focus target students for this year, and we're figuring out what do they need that's different. So um, that's kind of why things go hand in hand, because we're still learning and moving forward from our work last year into this year in math, um, and that's our academic piece. And then in terms of our social emotional, we started um, with using EES survey data and internal survey data and narrowed down three particular core areas that were um, of a higher need for our community was problem solving, safety, and belonging. And over the years, we've continued, like I said, adding other layers of interventions and supports that address these issues um, in our community with the idea that we need to get to 100% of positive response or favorable response from our students for all of these, because it's not it's never going to be okay to even have one student who doesn't feel like they belong in a community. So that needed to be at 100% favorable. Um, and when we looked at the data from last year, we made some really great gains. We had 100% of favorable responses to feeling safe in school, despite challenges, despite 
you know, things that come up here and there, overall our students felt really, you know, safe in our school community. Um, we had increases from people, who, students who responded to um, sometimes feeling safe to always. Um, we had increase um, in positive response with problem solving to 98% of students responding favorably. And then with our school belonging, we still, we still had a slice of never. And that's where we really wanted to lean in this year is, well, if we have a student who feels like they never belong, even if it's a small percentage that's only a handful, that's, we can't, we can't have that. It's not going to be um, acceptable. So this year, we're kind of taking along some of the things we started from last year. Um, well, Pack Block is definitely a way that we stay connected socially. So that's a component that we're also gaining from that time. Um, we're taking along our community circles. Uh, we've done a lot of work on that practice, both in terms of like knowing our community and responding to challenge within it. And then this year, a new piece that I already love because it's generated so much connection is our buddy classrooms are leading monthly um, belonging assemblies on a component of belonging. And I'm working with a family group um, that we have out of, out of our school called the We Are Islanders um, belonging team that really is trying to find ways for our whole school community to feel connected, to feel like they belong no matter who they are, what they do. You don't have to be a straight A student or a member of the varsity team. Like everyone is valuable in our community. And that group has helped us connect with other groups at the high school. Um, and, and elsewhere so that we can have this focus in our school around belonging and that message in common language, but then connect pieces from beyond our school community. So we're celebrating that, you know, we had our, the band down um, last week or the week before for our last belonging assembly. And it was, I mean, the video doesn't even do it justice. I know it's posted, but um, that's kind of the level we're working at is how do we feel like everyone feels good about being here every day. So. I'm sorry I took more than a little bit of time. <laughs> it's all, it's all good. Yeah. I told you, once you get going, you can't stop talking about your school. And that's just like the tip of the iceberg. Right. Like, it, I can obviously go on for a long time. I know our improvement plans are pretty condensed, but um, there's so much behind it. And behind all these numbers are kids. You know, these are percentages, but they're really every single number means a student. So um, that's why it's hard to stop sharing. So that's all. That I will say for now, I'm, I'm happy to address any questions that come up, and I'll pass it over to, I guess, to John. Yeah, Thank you, Principal Isaacson. Uh, I, to, I yeah. do have a question. Can you just talk a little bit more about what a buddy classroom is? Sure. Yeah, sorry, there's lots of like educational lingo and in, in terms. So in our building, we have a paired partnership <laughs> between a lower primary grade and an intermediate grade. And those, at the very, very least, in a whole year, this group of students from both classes and their teachers come up with how they want to represent their idea for the belonging assembly. So it's a word like welcome or invited or no, and they could write a skit together, they could do a video, they could do demonstrations of examples in the community, but that's the very least. And at the most, they're meeting regularly to read together, to do projects, to have a special recess together, to connect. And honestly, um, we our, our classes that are connected like that, I see them regularly sharing and connecting and visiting um like if a performance in, in music happens and sometimes the buddies will come and observe the performance so it's a way that students have a connection beyond their grade level of the classroom and um, it's an older peer especially for our primary students feels really important to know that you know even the big kids you know some someone who's got your back and um yeah so that's that's the buddy classrooms yeah Good evening. <laughs> ditto. Uh, yeah, ditto. Uh, I mean, I, I think you'll see there's commonalities amongst all of our uh, school improvement plans. Um, and uh, to, to kind of pick up on the SEL portion where Principal Isaac and Isaacson just left off, I'll kind of start there. Um, our goal last year um, it was really focused in on different areas of uh, where we, we knew we could see growth in the sense of belonging, inclusion, and connected, connectivity within uh, the Island Park community and, and our school. Um, and we took the data from the EES survey uh, last year, and while we saw improvements in the data in those particular points which are in the, which are in the SIP plan, um, I, I echo what Principal Isaacson says, that 82% um, of our students say that they have a, 
an adult in there in the building that they can talk to if they have a problem. But that's that means 18% of our students are saying that they don't. And so our goal really is to be 100% in these areas where we are creating a space where our kids feel safe, they feel connected to each other, to their peers, and connect to adults um, in our in our building. Um, much along the lines of what uh, Megan had shared, we have been. Um, in our second year of doing our buddy classes, which it seems like a very quote unquote elementary thing, um, but to see the interactions of little kids with bigger kids all throughout the school day, whether it's transitioning from recess back into the classroom, or they share a, share a common recess, or they're getting together to um, do a class activity. Um, there's real pride on both sides for the big kids and for the little kids. And um, we are uh, continuing that practice again this year. Along the lines of welcoming and being um, uh, creating a space of belonging, what we too are leading assemblies each month focusing on a character trait. Actually, our first one was on welcoming, on what does it mean to be welcome. And it was a really neat activity where we had students who were able to stand up in front of their peers and say welcome in what their the language that they speak with uh, in their home or with their families. And it was really powerful. And to hear kids say, I speak that too, you know, to make making connections with kids um, of all different grade levels. Um, and so we, while we're pleased with our growth um, and we saw growth in all of our areas, we did see we did see a dip in one particular area about students being respectful to each other. So that's an area of kind of intense focus for us this year as we continue to work to create a space where all kids feel um, that they're that they belong. Um, our math goal <clears throat> again is very much what along the lines of what Principal Isaacson shared. Um, it's about growth for all students. Um, uh, we for the past past few years at Island Park have been focused in on math and this year uh, each grade level took a look at their data and decided what was the area that they wanted to specific, specifically focus on. So you'll see in, in the SIP that three of the grade levels are, have a literacy focus and three of the grade levels have a math focus. Now the way that one of the things that we've learned over the last year having the iReady curriculum is how much information is there. And as Fred mentioned, I shared with him, you know, a spreadsheet that we're using at our school that we can go down to not only where the student is, a st particular student is in, in their, um, their, uh, their performance or where they are currently now, but it can break it down into specific domains. It's not just a math score, it's, it's a math in numbers and operations or algebraic thinking or measurement and data or geometry, and we can get, dive into that. Some of the reports that we can generate will tell teachers, hey, next steps for this student can, should be this in order to help them bolster their, um, uh, to, to, to encourage growth in those particular areas. And um, so um, you'll note that our kindergarten group, our second graders and our fifth graders are focusing in on literacy. Um, and then the, the uh, other grade levels are focusing in on various areas of math. Our goal is for all of our students in math holistically to grow by one year or more, and that includes all of our students. And um, while you'll see in the SIP that there may be a focus area for each of the grade levels, we really are looking at it holistically, but in conversations with classroom, with the grade level teams, those were areas where they particularly identified they want to pay particular attention to uh, when it comes to comprehension checks um, and benchmark advanced assessments, um, as well as the IREADY diagnostic, which we'll do um, three times, two more times. Uh, throughout this school year. Um, so that's, that's all I have. Two questions. All right. I do. I do. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Well, question tonight. Um, you talked about like a grade level making a decision about, you know, something to focus on, right? And I'm just curious how much communication there is between teachers teaching at a grade level like at the different schools. Like clearly you guys all communicate kind of on the principal level, but I'm just curious like if a math teacher you know, who's teaching third grade is like, oh, I did this great yeah. activity. Is there a way for that information to spread? Because like four years ago when I was first running for school board, I had a teacher say to me like that they were frustrated that like a good idea took years to propagate across the elementary schools. And I yeah. feel like since COVID, like that that rate has has sped up, like there's more ways that people communicate yeah. electronically yeah. and so forth. But I'm just kind of curious what the current state of that yeah, is. Yeah, that's a good question. And we've been intentional in our PD planning over the uh, since the beginning of the school year to, to build in time where uh, cross 
district grade level teams have that space together. Uh, I'm thinking of a, one of our PDs where um, I sat with the fifth grade team um, from all the fifth grade teams around the district and the conversation and the learning from each other was so rich that you know my team at, at Island Park had had found a had, had some particular information about the math the I ready math um, assessment and curriculum and all of that and were able to share that with with their colleagues there so we do recognize the value of our teachers having that space to be able to learn from each other, ask the questions from the people that are doing the same thing. So we're, we're pretty we're intentional about creating that for them. I think that was really kind of a silver lining coming out of COVID when they were all meeting as district-wide grade level teams to build our, our learning grids. Um, um, I can't, can you remember those? Um, I blocked out parts of those myself, but anyhow, but coming out of COVID, we hear that through all of our feedback um, from all of our PDs that they want, they just crave time to sit in a room together and cross pollinate ideas or just check their thinking with one another. another at the same PD that I think um, John was speaking of, I sat in a room with the third grade teachers from around the district and they just kind of clustered up in different configurations, cross building or and and just really dove deeply. I, I didn't have to do anything. I ha only had to stop them, <laughs> you know, because we're out of time. Um, and I think um, that you're spot on. That's and that it's it's actually helped us. Question of collaboration. We don't utilize anything like Slack, do we? And are there districts that do in terms of you know particularly for a channel to propagate ideas across grade levels, at least in the business world. Slack is probably like the preeminent or best known example of that for teams to be able to or Microsoft you know, teams. Yeah, you know, share very or, or or Microsoft Teams, like you which we already have a license to. Um, but if there is any formal way that we use that in order to create forms for you know elementary teachers at the same grade level at different schools to be able to collaborate. We've talked about that, and I'll let Andrew talk about. We use more of a lot of the Google Share drives, and so making those accessible. But I'll let you. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, we use Slack in a lot of uh, private industry and business applications. We haven't seen it as much in the education industry, but we're, we're starting to get a little bit, you know, more and seeing more adoption there. Uh, but it is tri primarily the Google Productivity Suite, where we look at either shared drives, shared. Um, Google Groups, uh, Hangout Groups, uh, Communication Groups, mm -hmm. um, as well as just shared documents within within that space. Uh, I would say one of the things that's nice about the district our size is we can get all of our a, all of our elementary teachers in the same room together, and we can get grade level teams together, mm -hmm. and we're all five minutes away from each other. So, yeah, um, and I know there's a lot of communication. Teams teams mm -hmm. have friends and colleagues. Colleagues that have become friends um, at, at all the elementary schools. Any other questions? How are we with uh, sharing the iReady information with parents? Does that get shared? Do mm -hmm. parents get to participate in, in this? So we just wrapped up our um, fall baseline diagnostic for using iReady uh, for both reading and math. And um, we sent home family letters to every single family on the results and it give, gave them the results by you know overall and then by the domains like the ones that are presented up there on the um, screen so yeah we're, we're working on getting that information out in a timely fashion to Thanks, parents sir. and then um, following up at fall conferences of course um, of course you know the baseline measure doesn't give us growth yeah. and that'll come mid-year and um, so that information out as well. Student director, any questions? Do you guys or do the teachers check in with students about their like I ready assessment? And they do a, like, oh, this is where you're at the beginning, middle, and end, then check in. Yeah, there's a component that's actually built into this curriculum. Obviously, like conferencing or giving feedback to students is a best practice in teaching in any way. Um, but there's a component that is around it's data chats and it's built into the time frame where they meet individually with students to confer with them. Um, we, we know that when student, I mean, you've probably experienced this too, when you know where you're at with your progress and you're being, you have the opportunity to reflect on that, 
you know what you're doing well, you know what you need to work on. That helps create a path forward for you and investment for you. The same thing with our kids, you know, kindergarten all the way up. It looks a little different, you know, the time frame and how much you're digging into it when you're kindergarten versus fifth grade. But um, that's that's built into our math programming. Mm -hmm. And I'll just use this as an opportunity to come back to Lake Ridge's <laughs> um, school improvement plan, if, if that's okay with everybody, because one of our focuses, so we're in year three of a four year plan, and one of our focuses all along has been student engagement, and more specifically, students owning their own learning. And so we're finally getting into this year into a, a full, having every classroom um, do a full student-led growth cycle is what we're calling that and that's um, that involves students self-reflecting on their own progress data and their own results in class and then monitoring their progress and setting goals for the next steps and um, because we know that that's a very high leverage powerful strategy to have kids owning their own learning and and working with their own data and like Megan hinted at the the data chats that are involved with our curriculum um, are are right in line with that with that goal. So, yeah. And it's a, it's kind of amazing that even a kindergartner can look at their. Mm -hmm. I learned this letter today, you know, and so they get to put a stamp on that letter, and then they set goals for themselves to learn the next mm -hmm. next letters mm -hmm. in the progression, mm -hmm. and then they come back to the teacher, and the te our kindergarten teachers have one on one data chats with them to monitor their their own goals that they set, mm -hmm. and that really builds um, that really hooks kids when when they can articulate what. So the learning becomes what, what they want to learn, not what we're telling them mm -hmm. to learn. And that's when you see. And they want to see the colors on their graph grow. I mean, they're very visual, yeah. but it's, it's a very proud moment. When yeah, and for, that, yeah. for our older I students. the colors on my graph, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't want that they graph? They've all worked at New Year. Start on your chair. And then for our older students, in fact, just in, um, a little over a week, all of our fourth and fifth graders, they do student-led conferences with their teachers and or with their teachers and their parents. And so they sit down with all of their data and their progress and walk their parents through how they're doing and where they're going. So um, and and thank you to the district, the board, schools foundation for getting us this iReady assessment tool because I in my time here. Um, which I'm in my seventh year here, I've never had such a user-friendly tool to really kind of root out growth and gaps yeah. for every single student. You know, we, we get a lot of data and there's a lot of ways to find the students that have gaps, but for those students that start out at and above grade level, it's really hard to have some actual data to know if we are giving them what they deserve a, a year's worth of growth growth for a year's worth of input and you know from a student lens you you deserve um high quality teaching and learning and growth if you're going to come to school every day <laughs> for for a year and so that's been just such an exceptionally helpful tool especially in math because when i got here kind of like megan hinted at we were very, we had a lot around literacy, but almost no tools for elementary to measure growth at math. I mean, our, our teachers in classrooms were um, giving pre-tests and post-tests and checks for understanding and using classroom-based measures, but from a high level, we didn't really have any um, kind of longitudinal mm -hmm. vertical data and certainly not, not quality growth measures. The only thing we had was the SBA and that's one day to point in time and it's really well I, I go ahead oh mm -hmm. question there's been a lot of discussion about the assessment tools with iReady um, and I have some questions about that in terms of how we should think about growth um, but in terms of there's also instructional material as well correct mm -hmm. within iReady mm -hmm. for math yeah. Is it just for math? Yes. Yeah. Not yeah. For we use the assessment tool of iReady's assessment tool for, for reading, but we don't use the iReady curriculum. We have the, there is events. the MyPath, um, which is a computer adaptive self um, supplemental, a supplemental um, kind of list of lessons yeah. that students can use that 
for iReady reading that comes with the assessment tool. And then how much but, the math of the instruction takes place within iReady versus paper? I'm just trying to get a sense of how much iReady is used as a tool and then in what capacities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, from the board perspective, I know it most you know, from the assessment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, perspective, but also I'm just curious in terms of on the content instruction, like getting a greater grasp of that. So that, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so, I'll let you for math, go ahead. it is, <laughs> for math, it, it's our curriculum. So it's our core curriculum in the classrooms. There's um, paper pencil activities and direct instruction and small group instruction. So it's not just putting kids in front of an iPad which I think there could be that perception, um, perhaps. So, so, yeah, so sometimes then is, does that mean, I'm just trying to figure it out, so yeah. if a kid is in math and you know, it has 400% growth, the paper copy that might be available to everyone else in the classroom might not be appropriate to that student that's had an explosive growth year. Right. So, or then they limit it to what's digitally available or, or separate paper copies printed out for those exercises, I'm just sort of the pragmatics mm -hmm. of how that different assessments manifest into different instructional content based upon where a student is at. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so the, go ahead, Megan. No, okay, you, no you do it. Um, okay, so <laughs> our, our teachers are, are having to resource, um, you know, multiple directions from where their grade level is at. You know, in one given classroom, you might have students three grade levels below, and maybe two, three grade levels above, right? So in terms of the core content for that grade level, um, there there's going to be paper pencil that's at that current grade, but also in the paper pencil version, they have a student uh, workbook or booklet or whatnot. I don't know the exact name we're calling it, but there's extensions and resources and scaffolds within those. Obviously the electronic teacher manual is what they're accessing most to pull from as a resource tool for small groups, which then, is printables or ones they can pull up in their small group and have that small group discussion and work on various means, whiteboard with manipulatives. So I feel like what Heidi is saying is true where you, you kind of have to tailor upward or downward. All of our teachers have access to all of those tools and then what that looks like in practice is a variety of different ways. For the MyPath technology component, it's 30 minutes a week. So I feel like it feels very technology heavy, but really it's, that's one piece of a small, you know, the pie is much larger than this iPad component. Mm -hmm. And because the tool, the assessment is all electronic, I think there is that misconception that the whole program is electronic, but that's, it's really a small component of it. A, a, a large majority of this program is based on the fundamentals of procedural uh, fluency, problem solving and reasoning, and conceptual understanding. And that conceptual understanding component is dialogue, it's discussion, it's working with different models. And a lot of that is hands-on for the grade level or the student of what they need, whether it's going straight to an algorithm and comparing it with the partner and connecting it to a different algorithm on their workbook, or they're literally pulling out the materials that are base 10 blocks and having to build it out. But it really has to you know, scale the range there. And they have access to grade levels higher, multiple grade level higher, um, the teachers do. Um, they just don't have a hard copy at that grade, at those upper grade levels, but they can dip into the, um, if I'm a third grade teacher, I can get into fourth, fifth, and sixth grade level material if I need to. Um, iReady also provides us, um, so they take the diagnostic, and the diagnostic determines a placement level in each one of the domains, and then it sets, it sets the, um, their path on the my path, so the lessons they'll receive. Um, first, they'll get the lessons in the domain that they're lowest in to kind of bring them up to speed, and then it'll cycle them to the other domains where they need to, and then it'll start exceeding those levels. Does that make sense a little bit? So that, that also meets every single student where they're at um, and takes them further, differentiates. Um, just it's computer adaptive. Yeah, and I've had um, this conversation with parents mm -hmm. too. When you say I ready, you just 
automatically think everything's on an iPad just by the name, right? So it's a bit of a misnomer, yeah. right? And so, so the the my path is is interactive on the iPad. That's that's the, the individual path mm -hmm. that each student will be working on. But there are whole group lessons. There's small group instruction that goes along with it. There's extensions through the Math and Action. Is that what we call it, Math and Action? Mm -hmm. uh, groups um, where kids are working in small groups and doing kind of more real world problem solving as as a group. Um, then there's the individualized workbooks. Um, you get lots of use of math and the manipulatives following the national. And then with, it, with every um, with every one of those domains, it um, gives the teacher it, it groups the students in five different leveled groups based on their performance on the diagnostic, and then provides teachers um, suggested, like these are the next step for this for this group, and these are the next steps for this group, and, and lessons and PDFs and so forth, to use for those five different levels. It's the so, richest so there's a program I've of... ever used in 25 years of being in education as a teacher and as an administrator. The amount of the resources and the amount of um, information we can really drill down uh, for each student is, it's, and as Heidi said earlier, we I've never really had a good math data um, set, uh, and this is this is the this is the best I've ever seen. I and wish I, I would have had it when I was teaching. Yeah, and our teachers are really jazzed about it. Mm -hmm. Like they're they're looking at those um, the the my path how many lessons they've passed and and how many t minutes they've spent on it. Um, every week, I have one teacher, for example, that's. That's the student-led growth cycle that she does every single week, and the kids get a print off of what lessons they've done, and that goes home, and so that they can have these conversations with their parents as well. So it, it like John said, it, it's one of the, it's probably the richest program that I've ever used. Um, we're still learning all the functionality of everything, um, but it's exciting to have have a tool. <laughs> you know, that comes with the data and assessment pieces as well as. Julie, do you want to add anything before I allow Heidi to go for her full plan? Do you have anything you want to add? No, I'm just, I, I love hearing them all talk and it's weird to unmute myself. So I've just been listening to them all and it, it actually makes me really happy to hear because a few years ago I was the head of the MAP adoption committee. And so to hear the reaction to the actual program is pretty exciting. So, no, they said all the things, and I'm just over here nodding my head like this. Great. How do you want to go for it? I know you okay. kind of have weaved in and out of your plan already. Yeah, you um, so I think I, I think I'm going to just um, skip over. I have lots of notes prepared, <laughs> um, but I think I'm going to skip over some of these things. And um, our, our academic goals are very similar to what you, you're going to read in all of the um other uh, school improvement plans and their growth focused, just like we've been we've been working on kind of guarantee. We call it the a growth guarantee, but guaranteeing about one year's growth for every single student for several years. So I'm going to let you. If you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, but I, what I would like to do is I would like to kind of um, connect the dots between why focus on social emotional learning and why focus on belonging um, in a learning institution. But it's, it's, I've had the same question myself. Like, is this the right focus for us to have? Shouldn't I be hyper-focused on achievement and growth for, for every group, subgroups, that kind of thing? And so I wanted to just take a minute and share with you um, some words from a podcast I was listening to recently. Um, well, let me let me back up. Before I do that, um, I hope that you'll also notice throughout our step those five bullet points that I um, highlighted at the very beginning, our priorities, um, making learning and belonging visible, building belonging, um, cognitive, cognitive and emotional student engagement, academic growth, um, and equity inclusion. I should have added in here somewhere, I'm not sure which bullet point to add it to, but this idea of identity and knowing every single student, knowing their name, their strengths, their needs, meeting them where they're at, and making them feel like they belong at, La at Lake Ridge in their classrooms, with their communities, and with our broader community. Um, and so thinking about how to, 
why why focus on all of these things like identity and inclusion and making kids feel belonging um and i was listening to a podcast it's called leaders coaching leaders and it's um it's uh they had Andy Hargreaves in there, you probably don't know who he is, he's a well-known re educational researcher out of Canada. And they were asking, that in this podcast, they were these um, two authors, Dennis Shirley and um, Andy Hargreaves, um, they work at a, at a municipal level, a government level, and so they were tasked um, by, I think it's the Canadian government, but some other states and so forth were part of this coalition. They were asked to go in and just assess how people, how their agencies were implementing um, the government agendas, the curriculum, that kind of thing. It, and when they went in, um, what really shouted out at them was that this issue of identity and inclusion and belonging undergirded everything that they were trying to assess when they were trying to assess how, how good is this curriculum and um, how strong are our kids growing. And so the, it goes on in this podcast and I, I, I just think they did such a marvelous way of simplifying a pretty complex um, conversation. And what he said was um, that if you think of identity, we all have identities, they're complex identities. We're not single di dimensional. So we're not, we're not just good at math or bad at math. We're not just a learner, we're, we're full multi-dimensional beings and so are our students. So identity was, was, is a big part of inclusion and inclusion is a big part of achievement. So there's that connection between achievement and um, belonging and identity. Um, so, just to put it simply, it's it's hard to it's hard to achieve if you don't feel like you belong there. It's hard to achieve if you don't feel included, and it's hard to feel included unless, in some very important ways, the school understands and pays attention to who you are and how the curriculum and the teaching and the learning works for or against you. And I just thought that was kind of interesting to think about to draw that connection between why work on social emotional learning as a institution or a school we're supposed to be focused on academics and so that's what i really wanted to share with you as kind of an underpinnings of why um, social emotional goal and engagement underneath a social emotional goal um, and belonging are highlighted in Lake Ridge's SIP and what I think it's very much the right work to be doing and our, our um, kind of um, simply put goal over these last few years has been to weave together social emotional um, and academic learning and teaching and all of those kinds of things um, with a you don't get one without the other approach um, and they think science and education is proving that you really don't get your best potential academic growth without paying attention to the social emotional side of the house and we we shouldn't be compartmentalizing those ever because you don't get one without the other so that was what i wanted to draw out or add can i add um, to that i love that heidi and um just you know um, the clarity that you brought to that I totally agree sometimes people is uh, people think it's this or that but we're mm -hmm. we're educating students in the basics like reading math and arithmetic and all those things right but then parallel is, is the SEL that mm -hmm. makes us make sense of the content that which is not robots we're making sense of it we're making a reflection of how it matters to us in uh, society and it's what makes us human right mm -hmm. Without that, I think we're just educating robots, and I think people forget that. Um, also, I think that um, in order to talk more about belonging, I think we need to see um, reflections of ourselves in the curriculum, like you said, and so we need to be really intentional about how do we, um, you know, like the ethnic curriculum that I think has been pushed down, but we haven't really done that much. 
and we don't have that much to do, right? But then, so like, how do we really push the state, get more resources for the district to really think about the ethnic curriculum? How do we make sure that our space reflect our students when they walk around the space that they see reflection of themselves? How do they see reflection of themselves in the people that they work with, the teachers that they teach? So I think those are really concrete things that the board can do to make sure that students feel like they belong because the word belonging is very big. And so I love that you broke it down into these concepts and so that we can have metrics to see. Otherwise, it comes to, and one of the things I have, uh, actually John, that the, uh, about the safe space, you know, uh, I, I must be getting old because as we get old, we think about big questions. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, you know, that, that whole most students are respectful to others at this school, you know, we went down on that, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, uh, if you can help me understand a little bit more of, is it because, you know, with COVID, we, re we see that students are, you know, a couple of years developmentally behind, I think, all the schools and uh, things that they might at this age have already learned uh, that they haven't, right? So we have to be a lot more thoughtful about intentionally helping them in their development, the SEL, you know, as well. Um, is it because of those kind of physical kind of interaction behavior to each other that they don't, uh, they don't, they don't feel that uh, other people are respectful, or like this is where I think I'm getting old as I'm thinking about this. Sometimes when we do such a good job in getting students to be really self-aware of themselves and learning about, I feel like students right now are so sophisticated when I was that age. The kids are absolutely are so sophisticated, yeah. you yes. know. And um, so as we do such a good job in having them to recognize right and wrong, for them to recognize all the different identities and being open and having words to express this. And this is where the, the, the leap is. Sometimes then I feel like, because with my other students in the college level too, I feel that as we do that, they, we, we add a little bit, a layer of righteousness and that they have, they have less tolerance in kind of the human failing and growth of other folks. Mm -hmm. So then you see, you know, as you're learning about yourself, then you're like, oh, you know, that people, that person is not respectful at all mm -hmm. because I can't believe they said what they said and did what they did. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, fifth grade boys are like different, right? right. Or girls, too. There's developmental challenges, I think, that we all go through, but sometimes as we're developing our students, and they get the words, but then, I don't know, so that's kind of where um, this data, I, I don't know what it's bringing up. Is it like people are just touching each other, you know, probably back, you know, kind of, uh, or they're judging each other in that, hey, that wasn't very respectful because we did such a good job in giving them tools and words, <laughs> but now we're not making them, now they're less tolerant. Hypercritical <laughs> yeah. of each other. Yes, yeah. and so I don't know, so that's kind of where... That, that's, that's, a, that's brilliantly put. <laughs> I mean, it's, I think it's, it's, that's, that's a line of, not thinking, but just concept that I've, been, I've thought about for a number of years, too. I, and to give you, a, to give you a, like a very concrete example, you know, when we do really intense lessons on bullying, the number of bullying reports increase. <laughs> where sometimes kids are just mean to each other, right? They say mean things, but it doesn't mm -hmm. fall into that category. So we're, we're so self-aware, or we're so aware of respectful behavior that yeah. usually maybe one does feed the other. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's like, and I've seen this with my own youngest kid, that, that a kid says something mean to another kid, and then that kid is like, marked as a bully by all the other kids they go oh, he was a bully do you you know he said this thing to this kid in second grade yeah and it's like there's not a lot of flex there's not a lot of like people learn people grow people develop maybe that kid's not so awful now you know yeah. like, so i think that's part of the whole concept of belonging it's like we belong to a community and we have to work together and obviously we also have to protect the rights of kids that are actually being bullied but sure, right. but but it's that, that it's like, you know, part of what belonging means is like we belong to a group and we work together and we learn from each other, you know. Um, and we have to do belonging for others. Yes. Right? So like, it's it's not just get belonging. Right. Yeah, you understand. have to do belonging yeah. for everybody around yeah. you. And, yeah. you know, yeah. interesting you brought up the, 
the bullying, um, like when we teach about bullying and like we just have Taffert Theater in to do their bullying prevention and what I've noticed over time is that now they're also including and we're also including in our education, um, understanding the bully and how did the bully get there, you know, and become that bully and how can we help the bully <laughs> understand their behavior and make them feel as part of as part of our community because oftentimes the bully develops for a reason because they're not feeling connected with the other students or it's a defensive or a protective kind of thing. So it's been an interesting um, kind of observation over over you know I don't know 20 29 years in <laughs> elementary education that I think really I did want to share from the representation there was just some really good news today, which is a, a big national study found that um, more kids now envision female scientists when people ask them to like draw a scientist. So that's progress. Yeah. Although now, of course, AI, if you ask AI for a picture of a scientist, it's all men. So, no, <laughs> so. It's gonna take a little while for yeah, that. Can, while I, for can that. I just shout out Jennifer Wright? Because yeah. that was one of the things throughout her service are, that we just came from, but they highlighted, is how she grew um, women leaders and girl leaders um, over the, that was a passion of hers throughout her lifetime. And uh, it's, it's a awesome thing to see. Yeah. Do you have a passion? I think it was interesting how you're talking about how they're like so self-aware and so like, I don't know sensitive is the right word, but we definitely talk about like our lights like we like we interact with kids through like coaching and when we visit and like mm -hmm. everything and kind of like a running joke in the high school is that these like millennials kids are like so aware of everything and so aware <laughs> of bullying and everything so like i think it's interesting to see like the numbers go down and kind of how like we see it as when we interact with them yeah throughout our mm -hmm. very yeah. self-aware but maybe not socially aware yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. we'll do two groups one that gets social emotional learning one that doesn't there you, go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, you can do that Deborah. <laughs> you're just socially aware but it's also socially adept because you need the skills you need the skills yeah. you need mm -hmm. to learn them you need to practice yeah. them and them. and yeah. kids used to learn those skills by honestly just being like kicked out of the house and running around on the streets and mm -hmm. learning <laughs> How to get along with each other. Survival. Lots of bad things about that model. Yeah. But 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 kids don't have that experience now. Most kids well, they have on Mercer Island. They have <laughs> on Mercer Island. They have it more than in a lot of other communities because our streets are relatively safer. Um, but it's still not that like okay, get out of the house and don't yeah. come home till dinner, it's right? Yeah. So it's a lot of structure. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, and so so I think they need to actually kind of. Be taught those skills, so they mean not just the awareness, but yeah. the, the practice. I avoided Daniel Court because there were boys in Daniel Court that if you, you just, you learned, like, don't go right. that way, don't go that way. Yeah. I don't know how to feel about this conversation. <laughs> David, did you have something? Um, no, yeah, it's just really funny. Like, I remember doing, like, something called Second Step. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Did the every school, school still have We did, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So, like, I remember, like, that explicitly told you, like, oh, like, don't assume in situations, like, telling you exactly what to do. And I, like, I feel like, personally, everyone thought, like, it was really cheesy, but I feel like it kind of helped. Like, it's like, oh, like, replaying the scenarios in my head, like, yeah. but, um, yeah, I think it's good that they're still living it, yeah. yeah. Did you have Kelso's choice? Um, Choices yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you have something? No. You, I, let's go to Julie. Principal newcomer. Oh, hi. First of all, I have to be very transparent. I'm sitting on the floor of an airport. So if you hear things around me, that's exactly. And I've never known how loud an airport was until I was sitting here trying to be on a meeting. The other thing I noticed is on Zoom, my glasses grow by like a hundred times. So I look like Edna Mood from The Incredibles. I don't think they would. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's really interesting to listen to all these. This is the longest I've heard about talking before. So I think this might actually be a strategy that my teammates can use in the future. Um, but I do see that empty chair right there and having a lot of FOMO. Um, so I, like the others, have a little bit of a hard time focusing on all of the celebrations. I immediately go to what needs to improve and how are we going to do that? So um, in my sort of time, uh, I just want to share the now what. So we looked at our data from last year. Um, I looked at it millions of times. Our building leadership team looked at it. 
our entire um, staff looked at it and um, we have kind of a unique student population at Northwood. So for instance, I'll give you one of our stats versus the other three schools. We had 70 students last year who were absent over 10% of the time. The other three schools topped out at like 35. And so we're like double in things like absences and certain things like that. So while we are also really prioritizing academics, we have some side things that we kind of need to work on because we look a little bit different. So um, for instance, when we found out we had 70 absence, 70 students who were absent over 10% of the time, uh, we did some sort of immediate things, uh, which included, uh, we added a bus to the Shorewood Apartments. We surveyed parents who had students who were absent. We looped in our nurses. We sent emails to family and we made phone calls to mitigate absences. You can imagine they were really excited to hear from their principal. Um, and I've never been so excited to look at absence data this year. So it was just printed and I'm gonna look to make sure that we're actually growing in that area because we can't grow in anything if we don't have butts in seats. And so um, that was one of our first barriers that we needed to mitigate. And um, oh, and the other thing we've added is our teachers when a student is absent, make a phone call and basically a positive home, like we miss you as soon as you're feeling better or you know whatever we're looking forward to seeing you again and i've gotten really positive feedback from parents about sort of the connection because i feel like again going back to belonging if you don't feel missed then you know it it kind of everything kind of goes in in a circle so um that was one of our big barriers that we're already starting to mitigate for um we all copycatted um West Mercer, we went to visit them last year and we were so impressed with their Wolfpack block that our team decided that we wanted to institute the same thing. Um, so we instituted a 35 minute success block, which is targeted small group instruction, um, four days a week in each classroom and we bring an extra adult in. So during that 35 minutes, um, one adult works with two groups and another adult works with two groups. And it really gives um, our students an opportunity to grow from where they are. So some students are emerging in their skills and some students have already reached standards so we can push them even further. Um, so it's an awesome opportunity for them to get sort of adult interaction. It's also an awesome opportunity for them to grow from where they are and we can uh, gently push them forward. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're bringing more adults into the learning so our support staff is being trained on those um, small group instruction mm -hmm. and impactful practices and every six to eight weeks we're doing data dives like i i have a sweatshirt that says i love data and poor director Glowitz, he got the matinee performance of this yesterday at my um pack meeting but uh mm -hmm. i love that i can pull up at any given point someone will say i'm worried about this kiddo in math and i can pull up their data and just look at it and we can have a real data rich conversation about it i know everybody already talked about it but i had to talk about it one more time um and then uh we really are working on we uh we wanted to sort of cut down transition time and normalize that all children learn differently and so we moved our special services classroom. Northwood was built in a way that the special services classrooms were put separate from sort of the main general education classroom. And that felt kind of icky and exclusionary. So we have taken the special services classroom and brought them and put them with the general education classrooms. So it has cut down on transition time, but it also really normalizes that some kids need tier two, some kids need tier three and kids are coming and going all day and um it's it's that sense of belonging um oh we have new um we have about 40 english language learners at northwood which is um again it's a diff it looks a little different than some of the other schools and so we're really integrating our english language um support staff and teacher in all our data meetings and how we can be supportive and we're adding you know a little snippet in our staff meetings of how can you support English English language learners um, because what's good for them is good for other students as well so we really took this data and I know you guys can all read it's up in front of you but we really took this data and said now what now what are we going to do in response to it um, and we took the umbrella of high expectations 
um, and we put all of our goals under that. So if you read any of Northwood's goals, they're big and bodacious and really um, aggressive. Um, and that's just who we are. Um, I said, there's no use in making a goal, a low bar that you can jump over, right? It's, we want to make really big goals that we're going to strive for. So um, I'm actually really excited about this year and I'm excited that we'll have um, data throughout the year to really measure how are we doing. Julie, can I ask you more about the absent demographic? You know, in like, let's say, if you usually when you think of absences, uh, you think of maybe uh, from districts that are, have a lower socioeconomic status, where, and, but uh, in, on Mercer Island, I mean, is that the same for, for Mercer Island? Or, because I know uh, a couple of years ago, somehow in my uh, extended family, and I have a huge extended family, I had a number of uh, deaths. And so uh, I took all my boys, because that's what we do. We go to all the funerals, right? And then one day, I got this postcard about the Becca bill. I'm like, oh, they sent out to everybody, right? And I realized it was targeted at me. <laughs> I was taking my kids out of school a lot, and I just didn't even think about it, right? It was just so, and I wonder sometimes culturally, and I was, so I'm curious about this data culturally, in, uh, because when we talk about extended family, you know, my extended family is very big, and so if there's weddings or death, you know, they're going to go to those things. and. And we don't think twice about pulling kids out, right? Um, also, if you have family, let's say, who travels abroad, uh, if I'm gonna spend money to go to Vietnam, we're gonna go for a month. And if I had to take my kids out for a week, you know, I'm not gonna really think that much either. Not saying it's good, uh, you know, because apparently the FICA bill truancy card was not to everybody. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, uh, but it makes us think about the demographic that we have and the kind of uh, kind of uh, yeah, families uh, and how as if these families, you know, this is what's happening, then what as a school district can we do to support, right? If people are uh, leaving to go to, you know, other countries for an extended period of time. Uh, and I know that we don't have like, a, we don't like to give you know, it's not, it's an, an excuse action, right? But then still, I mean, we're putting uh, the family in that position. And I would say for the most part, if I'm spending 3,000, you know, uh, I might take my kids out for a week. So that's kind of the challenge, not right or wrong, but I'm just curious about the absent data. Like what is the reason why? Is it similar to what, um, to like the Seattle School District kind of typical absence demographic? Or is it different on Mercer Island? So I didn't compare it to Seattle. I just started calling people, um, which is probably their worst nightmare. But I think they're getting them here this year. So that's kind of my uh, my reasoning. But we found a lot of different reasons that kids were absent. Some of them were very, um, uh, everything kind of goes hand in hand. Some of them were cultural, right? Somebody did get sick or somebody did, did die. And if they were traveling to Asia or Europe or any of those places, they did have want to stay for two weeks. But most of all, believe it or not, it was sick. The kids were sick. And so what I think, what, how we mitigated for that barrier is we put them in touch with the nurse because out of an abundance of caution after COVID, our parents particularly were keeping their kids home. And so basically we just gave them the phone number of the nurse and said, call the nurse in the morning and we can talk this through because some, you know, if a child has a runny nose, they don't have to stay home, you know. Um, and then there are there were other factors, you know, um, single parent households where mom would get a migraine and couldn't get the child to school, right? So, it, you know, there's just all these. There wasn't an overarching. There were a lot of different reasons, um, but we're helping the parents mitigate those reasons. Was that it? Was that it? What you were looking for? Oh yeah, no, no, it's super helpful. And I, uh, when you said sick, I'm thinking also a cultural thing. Sometimes in multi -general, uh, generational families, people get sick more often in the sense that, or they have to take, um, you know, grandma. Like my mom, if my kids take the the bus now, but if my mom can't take the kids to school, then that's it, you know, grandma. And so I, I think that has an impact, so a cultural impact, so that we need to kind of think of, um, about absence data from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say um, a couple things. One, um, I was very impressed with identifying 
sort of the abnormality in the data around absenteeism and then really you know, digging in and you know, trying to, making phone calls, having an action plan, finding out why that is and addressing it. Um, I, I like that proactive approach um, and I think it's very commendable. Two is like sort of more across the board when we think about growth, particularly with the level of insight that's provided with iReady. How should we think about what quote unquote typical growth is? Um, because what may be typical is a huge range and therefore should we be looking for the variability of growth in a year across the spectrum because if we don't have those students that are growing two or three hundred percent then it's perhaps suggesting that there's a ceiling and that we're not enabling the limitless potential of each student um, and so I, I, I guess I would just sort of push to, to think you know more you know as we get more data out there about what we're looking for in growth because when I see stretch growth for those that are behind and typical growth for everyone else that actually seems to be somewhat intention intention um, with the idea of different pathways for different students and it seems that we're perhaps trying to bring every student to the same level rather than for them to pursue and to equip them to learn at their own pace, whatever that may be. I have a question about... Do you, about, yeah, Do you need me to answer something, Dan? It, no, it, it was just like, I mean, for instance, like in the future, I would, you know, just as an individual board member, I would love to see the variability of growth. You know, like what percentage of students grow with two years in a year and then how is that reflected in the, in the textbooks mm -hmm. if everyone is growing at a hundred percent then to me that actually suggests that something is deeply wrong um because i would expect variation because we have students that are different yeah. and individual i i think it might help to talk about how you're using typical growth and stretch growth for all students regardless of whether or not they're already a great level ahead versus those who are a great level behind and what that looks like in, in terms of how that's the interplay with that so we so we are monitoring both typical and stretch growth for every single student right um so the typical growth for every student assumes about a year's growth from wherever they're placed by the initial diagnostic, right? So it places them at more or less, well below, slightly below, at or above, right? So it places them and then helps us measure is that child making a growth for, for themselves, right? It's measured against themselves, not against a grade level standard, right? So that we're monitoring that for every single student, regardless of where they start. Then um, the iReady, um, tool for students that for stretch growth in terms of stretch growth for students that on that fall diagnostic place below grade level then that stretch growth assumes that they will need to make um, make those stretch growth goals um, over the course of two years approximately two years you know they've got their whole algorithm to measure this um, but approximately a two-year um, gap closing um, target is what that stretch growth is monitoring but for the kids that placed at or above grade level the stretch growth um, for lack of an easier way to think about it if I start out at third at high third grade I'm a second grader and I start out at high third grade if I meet my stretch growth goal in a year that should take me to the next grade level so I wouldn't, let me, I didn't phrase that very well. So it's the beginning of third grade. I, I test at a fourth grade level. So in theory, at the beginning of, the, of fourth grade, if I do make typical growth, I would test at a fifth grade level. Does that make sense? So just one year in advance. If I make my um, uh, stretch growth goal, in theory, when I start that next year, I would be more than one grade level ahead. 
Does that make sense? So it's kind of an aggressive, I can't remember what they call it, advanced placement stretch goal um, for the at and above. Does that make sense? I think it's so 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 the semantics, which can be like yeah. a which tough, is, is that for different. certain students, typical growth, I mean, taking sports as an analogy, mm -hmm. just pick up skills and dexterity very quickly. So a typical growth could be two years or two and a half years. And then and there can be periods like where you have, where you where it really clicks like for a year and you just, there's bursts, right? Whether it's intellectually or physically. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my concern, or not concern, but just like sort of in the background is a lot of the premise of growth like has this very linear year on year, like across the board. Right for all students and seems to be gearing towards that and then you know then just adjusting if the student is behind to try to catch them up to where they would be on this ladder and to me that seems to conflict a little bit with the reality as well as the mission of just equipping each student to fulfill their potential whatever that may be and whatever their typical growth right. yeah. may be. I think yeah. I, I get what you're saying. Like we're not adjusting towards a median, basically. Yeah. Um, what I found digging into individual students, too, was there's a, there's a baseline overall score for every at grade level target. But when you dig in individually, every single individual's like <clears throat> annual typical growth measurement like where their scale score was and their stretch goal was different right. mm -hmm. so it it's it's even like off of any sort of grade level it's really just what's the progress for that student so i thought that was pretty unique that we're actually not even on like a, a norm scale grade to grade we're on like here's sort of the the bar but every single progress measure was tailored down and i, I felt like that was the, the most unique system that I'd seen and being able to assess down to the individual off scale like that. And that's why I was very carefully not saying exactly one year's growth, approximately one year's growth, more or less, just to understand it is that each, each student's kind of target with typical right. growth or stretch growth so is very two. tailored yeah. um, to where they start and getting them to work their, their potential. And all so. of our students, regardless of where they are, have a have a stretch growth goal in, in our system. So if I'm a, an above grade level student, my stretch growth goal is going to give me a typical year plus. And they're mm -hmm. aspirational, uh, but they're attainable. Mm -hmm. And that's where we end up seeing students that had 200, 300, 400 percent growth. Part of that comes through that my path in that independent study as well as the the instruction Target. that's happening in the classroom yeah, it's targeted really tar target. targeted to where what where they are and towards their group. and and we're still in the early days of understanding that tool too mm -hmm. i know that at lakebridge last year after each diagnostic we looked at every single kid and for those ones that were showing 200 percent growth we were questioning okay so was our baseline not valid, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. Um, was it just that the student didn't know how to use the tool? And there, there are, um, so we're really digging into mm -hmm. those kind of anomalies yeah. to understand the tool better. And there are options. We can have them retake the diagnostic <laughs> if they're flagged or if we flag them, we can have them retake. We could, the MyPath lessons that we were talking about earlier, we can, re, we can assign those accordingly. So if we see a student that's flying through all of them and we know they're ready for more, um, we can we can set them for different lessons. Does that make sense? There's a lot of functionality. I just don't think we fully have had enough time to really understand it for ourselves as well. So I'm sorry. I didn't see that. No. I just want to add on I mean I I know this is not the intent, uh, but you know sometimes when we talk a lot about stretch goals and we should because I think as a system, we should always offer these opportunities and pathways for all of our students. 
But sometimes when we focus on that a lot, I also want to, since I'm going to be an outgoing school board member, so I'm just going to put out all my agendas. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do we make sure that when we think about kind of prioritizing our time about equity, how do we really think about those who haven't met those goals, right? Put a lot of our times in there. Yes, we should have these stress goals for like two, three hundred kids who are flying by. And I, I love the conversation that we have so many students in the district like that. Um, but sometimes I feel like we don't uh, we don't talk about students who need a lot of support, and so I would like to see like as an institution, it's really our obligation to focus on those students, right? And then really address the majority of the students, and then get the extras to do the extras. Yeah. And so I think you know, kind of as a system. Otherwise, we, we think that everybody continually to surpass, and, and unwittingly the conversation is going towards this crazy race, right, of uh, uh, flying through all these things. So I'm just hearing these terminologies, mm -hmm. and so I would just kind of bring it back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, and I think that the, the system, like, throughout our district has been tweaked over the years because I know there was a point at which a lot of kids were kind of, like, skipping a year of math, and then they would get to the high school, and they mm -hmm. didn't have the foundation that mm -hmm. they needed. So it's not always better to, like, fly through, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it's important to know that we're not flying through it. Yeah. When we talk about those growth, those they, they are individualized. And the stretch growth goals, for example, for our students who are below grade level are the, the goal the leap is larger. And so that's where our really intense instruction comes in, looking at the data, understanding that, you know, this particular student has difficulty in manipulating numbers within base 10. So we're going to really target our instruction there because we've got to get those base, those kind of foundational pieces going or set and really solidified so that we can start making that growth. And I appreciate your comment about you know, a need to I skip a grade of math because we see it every, I've seen it my entire career. Kids get into middle school and high school and they hit a wall because there are gaps. And, you know, those are conversations we have with parents is that we've got to build our foundational skills and get our kids into a solid base. There's opportunity for advancement when they get to middle school and when they get to high school. Those opportunities are still going to be there, but we've got to make sure we've got a foundation really solid for our kids. I have a totally different question um, about the English language learners. I guess this is partly a question for you, Julie. Um, is, is the number of kiddos that you have that, that have those learning needs because of the geography of like where they're coming from on the island or are we concentrating them intentionally because I know there's English, lang English language learners at, um, at all the schools, schools that I've seen yeah, yeah we don't yeah. have like a manager yeah. Yeah. yeah so no we're not we're not we we didn't it's not like all of them are being sent to Northwood yeah. but we just have a we do have a high number um in, in general so it's just it's happenstance basically okay I think just in the realm of identity, I just want to name this to the group that that terminology has changed to multilingual student or students who are yes. multilingual. Um, there's a lot of identities about them, but um, that's a that's a strength to have another language. So I just want to name that. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? So I'll, I'll make uh, two comments. One, it'd be interesting to see if we ever get to the point where we have. Uh, in, in a grade level, pods where they change teachers for math students, for example, so they're at a teacher at the appropriate grade level. Mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, I think it's like in middle school, if you're having trouble with a certain type of math, you're with this teacher and everybody co-locates with this teacher. If you're progressing at this level, I don't know how that, what that does for belonging and inclusion. So I, I leave it, I'm just curious if that ever happens. Don't have to answer it now, but uh, I, I do think that, you know, in the desire to get a bell curve of student growth, you know, that has clearly worked in honors courses and all that. At the high school level, it clearly works in sports where we have differentiation of teams based on uh, ability of students, and yet somehow a teacher is supposed to handle such a broad spectrum of students which seems very difficult. And, you know, as we learned from COVID, having interaction with the teacher is super powerful. We, we learn, te kids don't learn without their teachers. Uh, and so I think uh, putting people into independent learning when they're at various parts of the spectrum, um, learning spectrum or growth spectrum, 
it doesn't necessarily serve them either. So I, I hope you see that at some point. The other one I will talk to is I really appreciate the idea of equity and belonging and the importance. Uh, we lost sight of that in corporations. I think in, in the business world, we didn't talk about that much. I mean, a big thing that business world can do is uh, cultural fit. I remember so many interviews where you'd uh, interview people for cultural fit and you would discard them if they didn't have cultural fit. Mm. You know, and that was a way of avoiding all the belonging, inclusion <laughs> uh, activities that we now have to do in schools. And so, you know, and I, I think that can even happen in private schools where you have cultural mm. fit that uh, eliminate students. So, you know, I, 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 it is powerful, it is important to learning, and it's especially important in a public school where we, we cannot discard students. Everybody has to, has to belong. Uh, I think there, there's two items, right? There's one which is, uh, you know, are you included by being invited to the, to the dance? And then another one, do you belong because you're asked to dance? And uh, I, I value the work we're doing here, and I think important to continue it. So thank you. I, I didn't have anything to say, but but based on yours, like what you're looking forward to. Thank you for the presentations. I um I, I especially Heidi with the the information you gave us about the belonging and how it connects to achievement. We know we know that the kids don't feel safe and secure. They're not going to learn because they have to feel that way before they're able to engage in their learning. So. That constant reminder, I think, is really important. We do often lose sight of that. What I'm interested in is more for the future. I'm not going off the board, so um, <laughs> not yet, at least. And so, um, as we have more and more combo classes, grade level combo classes, I'm going to be interested next year to kick, to get your feedback in terms of whether or not you're seeing different areas of growth for different kids in the combo classes, because I know that's a big area of concern. I know it has a lot of positives, and then, you know, obviously some negatives probably, but I'm just, I, as you look at all your data and have those resources, that's a question I know I'm gonna be asking in the future. Yeah. We're, 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 we have a lot of combo classes at Lake Ridge. Um, and it's early we're working on so kind of disaggregating yeah. our, our data by combo classes versus single grade classes and that kind of thing. We're not there yet. I don't have anything right. to share with you right at this moment other than just anecdotal I'll give you evidence. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's on Monday, my Heidi. That's on my <laughs> <laughs> I've got a long You have a three-day weekend? Yeah. <laughs> right, what else Thank you. you. No. But yeah, I think that's on, um, I know it's on our collective minds. I think we're later tonight maybe you talking about that but i was just going to say do you want them way. to yeah. <laughs> go into that where they talk about how classes are built and whatnot because that's part of the combination you know i think that feeds into your question there um whether or not you know i know they've been going for a while if you want them to go ahead with that if you want to stay to do that great we're having a slumber party here <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> So why don't you yeah. go into that? Um, and sure. Andrews, if you can pull up the document, there's a extra document on the agenda tonight underneath the SIP presentations for elementary. Mm -hmm. And it is about, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So the, it, I think you've had a number of these different conversations. It's a perfect segue, Director Lurie, and cool. that, you know, how are classes built? And I think that that's oftentimes a, a wonder in particular our combination classes because you know there, there can be a lot of um, tension uh, there especially at the beginning of the year it typically comes from our families who their kid is the fourth grader in a three four combination class and will my kid be challenged or what does that mean um, just a sidebar you know, I, I taught a five, six combination class one year and, and um, my nephew called me from Chicago over the weekend, so timely, and he said, hey, Uncle Fred, you know, just check it in. He never calls me. Um, <laughs> and he said, hey, you know, the reason why I'm calling is a, a friend of a friend, I was online, do you remember a kid, you know, Kevin Chow? And I was like, sure, you know, I had him in my class. He's like, you know, I met him in this this weird situation online or whatnot, and he, he just wants me to give you, or he wants me to give him your phone number. Is it okay if I do that? He had you, 
in the combination class, and it was one of the best years that he had ever had <laughs> being in a combination class. And so uh, we oftentimes talk that it's not always, um, sometimes it can be really powerful, just like when you put second graders with fifth graders for buddy classes or, or other ways. So it's, there's a lot of power. So why don't I turn it over to the four of you to talk a little bit about how you select classes. Do you, do you want us to just go through the whole document? Do you guys want to ask us questions about it? Have you, have you, what would you read prefer? it yet? What are your questions, I think? I think yeah. Yeah, that yeah, we would see. prefer to start with that. Yeah, so that's I have a right question thing. about um, when we have combination classes, if we're able to look at, for those that are the younger, even the older, um, being preserving the teacher that they have, because my understanding is one of the benefits um, particularly like there's been research for Finland and Estonia is where you have teachers that stay with the same cohort group from year to year that that uh, continuity produces big results mm -hmm. just because you know the teacher gets to know those students mm -hmm. better and better able to provide individualized instruction yeah. and so how mindful we are of that and then to what extent it becomes more of a permanent ongoing that will be built in right that you have the same teacher for two years. So when you when you do a system wide, yeah. a blended classroom uh, um, scenario, that would be that's the model. Um, I taught that in Lake Oswego when I was teaching a five six blend. So I would I would carry my fifth graders uh, up into sixth grade. Um, as a teacher, I loved it. Half of the students knew the routines, knew you knew how Mr. Walmuth worked. You know, they could say, hey, don't say that. You know, that's going to push his button, whatever it was. We didn't call it looping. Was, I taught a, yeah, one, two. Yeah, but we didn't, we didn't call it a loop <laughs> because, because we just, but we, yeah. but yeah, so I had two years with a group of students. And um, so, so in, when, when the entire system does that, then I think that's, that's a philosophy that we would want to discuss. Right now, we're kind of in one offs in terms of where we, where our student bubbles are in terms of uh, population that then create. Because of economics and of being mindful of class sizes, that we want to make sure that I mean, we, we can, so we create a, a blended or a split or a combined classroom, whatever the terminology you might want to use. So, um, look, you know, those would be decisions that I don't think we haven't talked about it as a team. But if we're going to be rolling over, would the would the younger students carry on? Now you have your so I have had yeah. sequential years. Um, with teachers and we've we've given uh, um, we don't give the parents the option whether to roll up because we need to balance all the classrooms the next year but we always roll up some of the kids um, with that with that same teacher if we're running for example now for a couple of years we've, we've run a one-two split at Lake Ridge and um, so some of the kids stay with that teacher and the others go to the other classrooms. And that's because you kind of get into this dilemma of uh, what if what if only one student needs or wants to be moved out, or what if they all want to move out? And then when you're rolling up to only maybe two and a half classes or one and a half classrooms, you don't have a lot of options to go with. And that's why we kind of retain the, the right to make that decision. But it is, it, but, I, I too taught in a one two. We called it a loop. <laughs> I don't know if that we was did. educationally I appropriate. That as teachers move and, and yes. um, grades. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sally today, and yeah. they all wanted her again. Mm -hmm. Just yes. And um, so it is. It is an, an interest. Um, um, I think look at the re the reason I started talking about it with Dr. Rundle was um, just hearing a lot of misconceptions about you know it's the advanced younger kids and then the behind older kids which I know is not fact and so I think having this conversation in public where um, the the many different factors that you look at um, would would help with that I think that um, from what I was hearing it came from students were saying it too, or at least this was from the parents, students were saying it too. I'm sure it's not the message they're getting, at least from adults in the building, but I think that the more information we have, if, you know, as we have made the decision to stay with smaller schools, this is going to be one of the impacts, and I think the more we're educated on the pros and cons and what factors into it, the better we're all for. I appreciate you bringing that up because I think there is a misconception that the lower of the two grades are the bright kids and the 
higher of the two grades are maybe the students who are not at grade level or, or at standard. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, one of the things that we would know, if we were to do that model, our high fourth graders would leap our low fifth Pretty graders. Close. And it's just, and, and I'm, I'm saying four and five as examples. Um, and it's not to say that, um, that they would necessarily leap over, but the, there, there's this belief that that's how this is set up. The reality is in any of our classrooms, we have students who are two grades below grade level and two grades above grade level if it's a second grade classroom. I mean, that's the reality of what our teachers do. So when you talk about whether there's a benefit or a deficit to this type of model, our teachers at all grade levels are doing this, teaching various levels of students all the time in each of the academic areas. And one of the things we do in our classrooms is we focus in on data, who's where, what do we need to focus on, small group instruction, using our paraeducators as support uh, in our classrooms, having our teachers working with our students, um, you know, our, our students who maybe may need additional uh, learning or addition, additional support. We want our most highly qualified people working with those students as well. And so there's a lot of factors that go into it, but I think you're right. I think that's one of the things that, that students and families will say, well, I must not be as smart as the other kids in my grade level because I got put into this class and that couldn't be fun. Yeah, I think your point goes actually back to Director D'Souza's mm -hmm. comment earlier about like, is there a possibility of walking to different grades? Students are placed in kindergarten based on their age, and we matriculate grade to grade, especially in Washington State. Um, we know that retention is not successful for students, and we, we matriculate that way on your age. That's kind of arbitrary when we talk about need. And so John already talked about this, the spectrum of learners in a classroom. But if you take the grade number away, just throw it out, mm -hmm. um, what you're doing, like what you described, is you're finding ways to group students appropriately. And whether that's physically moving to another location, in your example, um, we kind of do that for a Wolfpack block, depending where the students go to group their, their, um, with their teacher. But in terms of a combination class, I feel like the idea of what instruction looks like in elementary school, at least when I went to school too, is like the whole class is together all the time and teachers standing at the front or sitting in the front. And that's really such a small part of learning. There's so much rotation. There's so much small group instruction. There's so much that's tailored down so far that we're really talking about like what's the core tier one that everyone has and what's broken up, but in a combination class, of which I actually taught as well, um, you're, doing, you're doing that grade level content for each group, but then you actually can get more flexible with where students need to go rather than less flexible. Um, so yeah, that's just what I'm connecting this to. And honestly, the multi-tiered systems of support model is I think something we should be talking about more right. because that's where's our core, Where's our tier two? And that means both scaffolding and extending. And where's our t tier three scaffolding and extending? Like you mentioned earlier, like we don't want to lose that and go race to the, mm -hmm. you know, the exactly. ceiling or whatever. But um, really, you're looking at a tiered model in every classroom and throw the grade out. You're still doing that. So Wait, what you're describing actually sounds a lot like how the workplace has evolved, like the modern workplace, because if you think about like you know, movies where somebody's like an accountant and everybody's sitting at a desk doing like the identical thing, right? Yeah. Like that is actually how a lot of workplaces used to be. Yeah. And now it's like much more collaborative and it's much more groups and it's much more sort of individual, mm -hmm. individualized assignments and that kind of thing. So it's kind of like a, a parallel of yeah. that we've had yeah. in education. Yeah. And if you think of it, once you leave elementary school, you're never moved this way again yeah. by just your age. Like when you get into middle school, high school, college, and real life, you know you're going to be grouped with other other people, students that need the same things you want, or you need, in. or interested in. So um, I think there's more benefit than. Um, I appreciate that Deborah brought this up because I think that as we're uh, talking about like if we're staying in four schools. What are some of the consequences? All right. What are some of the things that we have to do to adapt to that? And if this is going to be more of a norm, how do we get proactive and start to message? Because it's a cultural shift, mm -hmm. like you said. Sure. We're, we're right. grouping yeah. each, and that's it, right? But my son was in a, a split class with uh, Miss Kirby, split, right? 
And uh, he did come home and he did say that, hey mom, so and so thought I was held back. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, how did you feel about that? He's like, no, I'm like, I got Miss Amy, so I'm good. <laughs> so he yeah. didn't care what grade, whether it's fourth or fifth grade, right? <laughs> so he really enjoyed her. But some other people did thought he was held back because he was had the same teacher. Um, he got her twice. Yeah, he got twice. That's why he, so he didn't care. He's like, I don't care what grade. He didn't care what age for. And I'm it's, like, good for you. It's not just messaging, but it's also like helping parents learn how can they support their kid who's exactly. in a multi-age environment. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he had a great yeah. time. He had that great two years. Mm -hmm. And but it is if I reacted weirdly, then he would be like, Oh, did yeah. I get help back? Right. And I'm like, right. That's yeah. really important. So he was parents totally, think about, right? Like yeah, exactly. If, if your kid comes home and, and, and you're like, Oh, this is so bad, this you know, split classroom, like your kid is really gonna sure. soak that is, in yeah. and like it's gonna affect yeah. their attitude. Yeah. It is about standing that we call them grades rather than like this is the nine year old classroom. Mm -hmm. Because it is. It's mm -hmm. the this is where the nine year olds are. I mean, where Mostly. else do we do that? You're right. It's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're reaching a conclusion here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, it's been a long long evening for you all, so thank you very much. I just want to give them, uh, last month was uh, Principal Appreciation Month, and I ordered these, but they didn't show up, so I only talked about it, but um, I had a colleague in Colorado right as I was becoming a principal who was dearly um, loved as a principal um, in two different schools, and he was mid-career and unfortunately uh, lost a battle to cancer. But. Um, in honor of that, all the principals in the district receive lighthouses because of principals of like a lighthouse. And so I had given them something, but I want to give you your lighthouse pin. It says being excellent principals. <laughs> Julia, you'll get yours uh, next week. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, it's, let's take a five minute break right now and then we'll get started again. Thank you.
Already? Okay. Let's uh, call this meeting back to order again. And uh, we will continue with uh, item 3B, Board Policy 1250, Students and Governing Boards, uh, Student Rep Report. Avery and Asha, please. Avery, can you start today? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So um, we had our latest SSA meeting last week, or wait, yeah, last week on Wednesday. And um, we got some fun stuff um, from the students. So first, the elementary. Um, there's, um, there's been a lot of cool like extracurriculars, um, including like student councils at Lakewood and Island Park, who have put on spirit days for the schools. So that's like a, really similar to the I, the Island Middle School and like the high school who also has spirit days, and also Northwood held a fall festival. So like they're definitely like the elementary schools have a lot of fun events, and then um, there's also been a lot of Halloween celebrations, and a lot of kids and teachers have dressed up, which is super fun to see all the spirit. And also as more holidays approach, um, approach, the libraries at the elementary schools have been celebrating holidays in different cultures and like educating the kids um, when they go to the library. And then um, the adoption of iReady in the elementary schools have meant that there's been a surplus of previous curriculums. And um, in addition, like, so um, the schools are using, are partnering with, um, with organizations like CORE Tanzania and the Book Project to donate um, surplus uh, materials uh, to countries who need it, kind of like um, Chloe and Zach's yeah, project. Um, and then, yeah, so like as the elementary school principals talked about, they've been doing a lot of assemblies at the elementary schools. It's been really good to see like all the band, orchestra, and choir students who have recently started in fifth grade get to like perform for the first time. Um, also, all the elementary schools recently had their Veterans Day assembly. And then at West Mercer, um, band members in older grades came to an assembly um, to perform with them as part of the We Are Islanders campaign. And so it's really nice to see that like all the schools are focusing on belonging, and we were able to talk about that at SSA. And then also the Daffodil Project, the Holocaust Education Committee from the high school went to Northwood to educate the students, and they planted um, daffodils in the reverence of the children who died. That was really impactful. Mm -hmm. And then at the middle school, there's a whopping 28 clubs that are continuing to grow. And this includes the new um, news club, who just created a website, which is really exciting. And the middle school also has a robotics program that meets up at the high school. And it's like in conjunction with the high schoolers um, and it's really exciting that they can like branch out and really grow their robotics experience. And then um, as trimester two approaches um, for the middle school, um, the fall sports have started to wrap up. So there's been a lot of banquets and um, things for like cross country and volleyball. And then um, the drill team has also been preparing for their first competition. So it's like the drill, the middle school drill team that's in partnering with um, some high school drill team members. So that's also very exciting. And then there's also been high participation for student run spirit weeks, kind of like in the, the elementary school. And um, this is really great for like the school culture and like belonging because everyone's <coughs> dressing up. And then um, also the middle school winter assembly is coming up. And this is where like the quiet, the fine arts, like the choir band orchestra will be playing together for the first time. So that's exciting too. Yeah, so the middle school has implemented a new student recognition program and they've also continued their duck hunt. This new student rec recognition system is where teachers give like passes or like a note when their students are doing well and then they can like put it in a bucket at lunch and then they wrap all certain things like maybe like a skip the lunch line pass or like a notebook or like some fun thing that they have going so that's been really exciting. And there's also a new IMS Instagram, which is at Islander Gators, if any of you guys want to follow it. <laughs> and um, we heard from SSA uh, last week, and there was just a couple of concerns from, of the, from the Islander Middle School, and it was just, they were saying how like, hurtful language is often been used inside the middle school, and so it's just kind of an awkward time period where students are kind of figuring out like what's okay to say and what's not okay to say. And then also just some, some like facilities things, there's been a lot of um, trash left at lunch at the middle school and also at the South End QMC and Starbucks has been getting kind of like overrun with middle schoolers. So 
I wonder if there's ways we can kind of like get them to pick up after themselves, but also against middle schoolers. So. <laughs> yes, and then um, at the high school, uh, since our last meeting, we celebrated homecoming and Halloween. So definitely a lot of spirit around that and like the homecoming parade, a lot of fun events. And then um, a lot of fall, fall sports are starting to end and like winter sports are starting up. So like the deadlines are registration, registrate, wait, register for a lot of um, winter sports was today. And um, a lot of successes in sports. So like our boys um, tennis and girls swive teams have won districts and have moved on to state. And the cross country has also moved to state um, for both, both boys and girls. And then the last home football game was um, Friday, October 27th. And this was the All Island Band Night, which is really cool to see the, the elementary schoolers, middle schoolers, and high school bands connect. And um, the unified sports game a unified sports team also played their varsity football game and um, is now preparing for the basketball season. So that's really cool to see. And then also today, uh, tonight is the first night of drama's first presentation of Spamalot from the film classic, film classic Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Um, yeah, so we saw like on the drive here, we saw a lot of people lining up to see that. So I want to see that too. And then um, something really cool is um, MIH's senior Grace Go joined lawmakers to advocate for the mental health um, lawsuit and advocate against uh, social media giants, or yeah, advocate for mental health of all users of social media giants, um, Meta and Instagram. Yeah, so at Crest we had a guest speaker. Um, her name was Judy Kusakabi. Um, she's she uh, was a she spoke about Japanese American internment camps, and so that was really nice for Crest to have that opportunity. And also with that, a Crest class also went to the Wing Luke Museum to learn about the history of Asian American experience, which is really great. The horticulture class dissected pumpkins to investigate parts of pumpkins and how seeds are formed, which is really exciting. We also had alum Andrew Housen return to the ASB leadership room and talk about time management, building advocacy skills, and developing resources in college. Our HOSA Health Occupation Students of America had a ROTC medical trainer come with, or trailer come and kind of like teach them some cool stuff, which is really great for students who already know they want to be on that medical track. Um, the teachers have been putting in quarter grades. They were due at 3 p.m. today. Um, so they've been working on that. And our staff has also been working on putting out tech um, quick bits, where it's like they like post on like, YouTube and like Schoology on like how to do like navigate the new tech stuff. Um, as Dr. Ron talked about, the counselors and career center have been open to students over the past couple weeks and they've been hosting a lot of workshops. Like they'll put it on school with you, you know, be like, you can come in during this time and drop by and work on your application and like do all their stuff. And I think Miss um, Kenyon, the teacher, she's been really good about providing other options other than four year colleges because like that's not always the best option for all students. And she has really nice catalogs and really nice room for like people to come in and like hang out and like talk with them. And then we did meet with SSA last week and we talked about belonging at our individual schools. So we had talked about what belonging meant to be an Islander, but we kind of like went into like what it means to be um, belong at our individual schools. So we'll be kind of thinking about that and thinking about what are the barriers inside each school to, that keep kids from feeling like they belong and kind of working on action items over the next couple of SSA meetings to kind of figure out what is things we can do to help increase belonging. So yeah, that's it. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Any questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious about um, Grace Go joining. Did you say she joined the lawsuit just like as an individual, or is she volunteering with it, or like what's the connection then? Um, so a lot of like there was like 30 students who like as a group joined a couple of Washington State lawyers. It's like the state is suing. It's not like the gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I think there was a presentation on TV about it where she spoke <coughs> along with the Washington State AG uh, about the issues and about how social media impacted her. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty neat, pretty, very powerful. We had that on our social media and different things. Two weeks ago? Two weeks ago? Two weeks ago. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, 
Ivraj, and thank you uh, for bringing this uh, to us again, as you always do. And they'll be representing uh, Student Voice next week at the WASDA conference. I know getting together with other student directors from across the state and uh, being part of some work, I think, with your colleagues next week, too. And uh, then with that, let's move on to uh, 3C, uh, Facilities and Capital Assets, Position Paper and School Consolidations in Reading. Great. Um, you want to come up, Randy, just in case we have any. Uh, following last meeting, uh, we have brought, brought together some um, a sample of what it might look like in terms of something that you vote on. Uh, and then um, Brandy went back taking the notes and kind of reworked some things, um, shared it with me, kind of thought about some things. And so we're just bringing it back to you. We think we've captured everything. We have a red line version for you um, if you want to see what was changed. Uh, and then the other one is written as draft right now until you formalize it. And again, this really has to do with the conversations around consolidation. Things you want to add? Or... No, I think that pretty well summarizes it. Okay. <laughs> Any uh, directors and questions? Any thoughts? Um, yeah, I just quickly, I mean, thank you for putting this together. Um, I think you did an exceptional job. Uh, for me, individually in voting with it, I think what it recognizes isn't locking us into a permanent position as a school board, but recognizing that community, school communities and elementary school communities are focal points in our island, and that for, I think, a future board, you know, to consider consolidation, there needs to be um, particularly persuasive reasons um, for it at that time, and that I think at this time, I just the, the rationale for consolidation, uh, for financial reasons, um, there wasn't uh, a case that was made that the costs uh, justified the dislocation in community, particularly at this moment in time. And that hopefully for a future board, um, before considering um, any changes in the status quo and the footprint, um, I think we need, or should, be advised to have uh, I think pers particularly persuasive rationale um, for any changes to the to the current state of being. And, and thank you for your time. And I think it's a recognition that uh, the board listens uh, and considers, and that uh, you know, conclusions are not predetermined by the importance of process. Any other directors for the speak? I kind of feel like we've, we've had the discussions before, and I'm like just keep rehashing it, but I, I'm very happy with this, how this has ended up. I feel like it it, it includes all the major points that, that were important to board members, and I think that were important to community members who, who you know, contributed comments and emails and so forth, so yeah. looks good to me. Students? Um, okay. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say, I, I'm still a little bit uncomfortable with the word urges in terms of this board urges future boards. I, I don't have an issue with it. What my concern is, is while I agree with Dan that this is our decision at this moment in time, I don't want any future board to feel um, any, any, you know, life changes and the community changes and, and, and the circumstances change. So to me, what this means is, um, you know, these are the things that we really looked at at this moment in time. You know, the same thing kind of happened 10 years ago. Um, we came to similar conclusions, but who knows in 10 years if, if they will. And I just don't want to see, I don't, um, you know, we don't, we want, we want hopefully boards learn from each other um, is kind of the way that I look at it, but I don't, I don't have a best suggestion on a better way to say that. So it's, I don't have an issue with it. I just, to me, that's the intention. This isn't locking, you know, next year's board might very well make a different decision based on the factor. So, I think it's a really good, um, you know, maybe even talking in in the near future about adding. I mean, we are we are we do update the long range facilities plan every year or so, and um, you know, to make to make consolidation uh, the consideration be addressed, if 
be it very briefly in each of them. Because like we said, it's one of the biggest challenges was the surprise. And if we make it a regular point of consideration, hopefully it'll still be a surprise when anything changes like that. But at least people know it's a consideration, just like open enrollment. So, but thank you. You go, Asher, any thoughts? Not really. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate this document. I think it helps build a plan that we can move forward on in many different ways. So I think a few things. It really reinforces and appreciates the work Fred has been doing to showcase our, Fred and Ian have been doing to showcase our school district and our successes and make this a very desirable place to be. This is all about recruitment and rebuilding enrollment. I think Jessica mentioned that as well. We've heard that many times. It's important to rebuild our enrollment. I think there's a huge activity being put on that. That's unbelievable compared to any corporate marketing job being done by two people is pretty darn amazing. I think it reinforces that. I think it also reinforces the work we've done on budget to make sure our budget and our fund balance comes back to normal so that we are prepared for the next pandemic or rainy day. And that focus is important. It reinforces the work we have done in preserving regionalization. And we need to continue that effort to ensure that our teachers are well paid and want to remain in our school district. So this plan allows us to say that those type of activities are important. We also need to continue our work on trying to get a local levy increased from $2,500 to $3,000. That would give us significant breathing room around keeping these schools open. And it would help fix and address a bunch of the inflationary conditions that have emerged that make it harder for our local levy to pay for the differential local education that we want. So I think this plan allows all that. I think this plan also enables Brandy to think about how we spend our capital projects fund with respect to maintaining our existing schools. How do we keep poor schools going? How do we in the future with respect to bonds start thinking about a bond plan that revolves around preserving four elementary schools and rebuilding our middle school and extending our high school as needed. I think this plan also tempers and understands our enrollment decline. We understand we're in an enrollment decline, but this plan also buys us time for enrollment to come back up and say in the next five years, if things change dramatically, very different decisions could be made. So I think this has a lot of support. It fixes some of the quicksand that I think our previous plans were under. So I appreciate the work of the Long Range Facilities Committee, the board, all our constituents and community who have come out and expressed the desire that Mercer Island is about community schools and is about building community around schools, our student input, our staff and teachers, and our custodians and our teachers union all came out in support of this plan. So appreciate it a lot. Lots of listening, as Dan has mentioned. So uh, very happy to uh, vote in positive on this. Is there anybody else who would like to make a statement? I, I, do, I do actually have one, one thing to add to everything that everyone has said, which I fully agree with, which is just that, that I hope that, that the community will see this and know that we meant it when we said we weren't making any presuppositions. We had not pre-decided this. I think there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of fear and, you know, suspicion kind of, you know, when this discussion started. And I'm hoping that as we move forward with kind of the next phases of talking about what we are now going to do with our four 
lovely elementary schools that people can remember this moment and can just assume positive intent on the part of the board and the district that we're doing our best to communicate and we're doing our best to listen. And in this case, we have really have listened. So um, I hope that that like good goodwill will kind of float us forward as we as we move forward. And so, you know, Monday night, speaking of next steps, uh, Monday night we'll reconvene the committee. Um, Director Lurie and Director Blowitz will be there. Um, we're going to come back, talk more about uh, the survey, kind of where we are, start showing uh, some of the thinking that we have, um, that we've been having um, with Director Kuhn, Director Sullivan, the two of us, and then we're on track for January to bring forward the long range facility plan to the board to be able to um, help us think about some more. And then from there, take direction on our next steps on where we go in terms of um, whether or not it's just a cap, cap tech type of um, move or whether or not we wanna start scoping out something that might lead to a bond. So it's exciting um, of where we're getting to. And, and I think to your point, Director Tucker, we've been, having an email exchange with a community member um, who's brought up some great points about, you know, we have things in there about the high school. Is that locked in? And to that point, nothing's locked in. You know, there's lots of things and that's the exciting time of where we are in the process. And I just want to, I just, I, I mean, I, I plan on setting this on Monday. I know um, I, I've, had, I've had several community uh, participants on the committee um, whether it was you know kind of feeling like oh we failed right because the community didn't support the conclusion of the committee and and um you know we really struggled with we like both both kind of the administrative team and then also the committee really struggled with you know you can't really talk about all the factors without considering consolidation because it is so looped in with it's it's just connected you can't do it so then we have that conversation all throughout um, and this is just the direction that the committee went to. And I, I know I know people weren't all thrilled with that choice. It really was in the light of what the community financially would support. Um, and and you know, to reiterate what everybody said in terms of, you know, I mean, we're building these schools, frankly, for the future. It's, it's not going to impact very many of our kids at all, um, of our current kids at all. Uh, and um, it was such it's such an important um, service that that each committee member brought it was thoughtful conversations and you know if you're gonna say based on community what's the number you know I, I think that the recommendations would have been very different and it's lessons learned from 2012 bond failure the 2014 bond success and thinking like we need to go smaller because the community is not going to support the bigger and they saw smaller as the the price tag it's going to be higher because it's a whole nother school but you know hopefully people will get behind that and support it as as that's the value that was very clear um and i know and, and i think the committee should be really proud of itself for having those difficult conversations and and i don't think anyone should be upset about where the, the community came in from i think in a way it should be um, a relief that the committee's values i mean it was clear that um that you know, new facilities were supported and needed, and really just trying to look at the economic impact on all of our people. I was at the um, WASDA networking call today, and, and they, the, the topic was the Kaikum uh, lawsuit, which is the school construction lawsuit, and learned that there were there's seven bonds on the statewide, seven failing. So, you know, and, and we did get called the wealthy district. It's like, um, but in their comparison, anyways, I could talk about that during board report, but but um, it's a really important role. It's very challenging to really come up with the right decision, and I think that um, you know we're heading in the now that we can put that this decision's been made, um, we can move forward and figure out the the next steps for our buildings. Okay. Um, I know this has been said, but I hope the committee doesn't uh, think of the work as a failure. And that I think when we start any large process, the first initial process is gathering a kind of a focus group, a committed group of committee members who did the heavy work 
to look around and give us a recommendation, right? And then part of our job is taking that recommendation and test it out with the community. So this is part of the process and whether it continued forward or it kind of got modified, but it shouldn't be thought of as a failure, right? They did their work really well. They're giving us, from that perspective, something that's really important that if the next board comes along and say, hey, you know, this for uh, school solution is maybe not working even when you see in the future it changes, then we were also, you know, this work is not going to go to waste. So I think that was part of the process that, um, and they did a lot of good work for us in doing the heavy lift and got us to this point in the conversation. And I think it worked out how it should, as if we have a good process, things will flush out the way that they should and to be at this moment. So. Um, yeah, I, I think we all we all came out on top. The whole community uh, community came out on top of this is where the community is feeling now. I don't know how they feel in the next year or two years as we begin to have to make decisions and choices. You know, I don't know where things are, but this is a good place to be. And so I hope I think you mentioned that. I hope the next board doesn't think that because of this that this is the only path. Right. This is a, a moment in time capturing what we're feeling and as new information comes and as new decisions are, new, new needs are coming across and as people make a decision that they feel empowered to listen to the community again at that moment and that might change mm -hmm. or not. Thank you. Um, could I have a motion to approve the MI Elementary Consolidation document? So moved. Second, please. Seconded. Thank you. All in favor, students? Aye. And directors? Aye. 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 Uh, that's uh, passes uh, against. That something like passes 2050. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, let's keep moving forward. We're almost at uh, the end here. Um, Four, full governance process monitoring, board policy 1005, board officer and board member duties. So this is a uh, self uh, vote of determination of compliance. Do we want to walk through the individual items or would we like to do this as a whole? I'm fine with the whole, it's a lot of one. I'm fine with it as a whole. I just have one question though, which is it doesn't say in here, does it, that um, that we like the board assigns itself to committees other than the legislative role and in the vice president role, because um, it says annual organizational meeting. That first item, it just describes electing a president, a vice president, and a ledge rep. I'm fine with it how it is, but I'm just noting that it doesn't. It's here. Why is the page three? Last paragraph. Oh, individual board. Oh, oh, see. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's a that's a, as as a board duty, but that's not like an organizational thing. Yeah, we should do the language update uh, next time. It sounds yeah. like a good call for the yeah, language that's update. That's all. Just just to ma to match up with the reality of kind of yeah. how we do things. That typically we do that in December as well. So right. that's all. Yeah, but otherwise, I'm fine with it as a whole. If Director Din or or Director D'Souza, you have input though, now would be a good time because at the next meeting, mm -hmm. you're only here to approve the minutes and then not that other part. Mm -hmm. So if you do have other pieces. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Short timer. <laughs> 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 <It's not this. laughs> okay. Um, with that, could I have a motion to approve Board Policy 1005 Board Officers, please? So moved. Second. Seconded. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Uh, students? Uh, aye. And directors? Aye. aye. Against? Okay, with that, it's uh, 2050 approved, uh, is in compliance. Uh, that one I wonder if students vote on because it's board compliant. But, <laughs> yeah. So, it's, but you know, maybe maybe it's okay. Uh, it, it's it's a good self test of us. <laughs> but some some of the a lot of the 
individual items actually do do are relevant to the students. Like you know, they, that as board members, they don't you know speak on behalf of the board, for example. Yeah. So. Well, maybe that should be part of the language update too, uh, as well, to make it student inclusive. Oh, that's a great that idea. That might be an interesting. Yes. Um, okay, let's move to their consent agenda. My lost consent agenda. Um, all in favor of approving the consent agenda is published. Uh, sorry, I needed a motion. First. I move that we <laughs> that we approve the consent agenda as published. Thank you. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor. As uh, students? Aye. And directors? Aye. 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 Against? And the consent agenda is so approved, 2050. Uh, superintendent announcements? Yeah. Uh, just a couple of announcements um, for us. Uh, one is um, the workforce diversification report that would come in December. Um, the state has not updated any of their numbers, and I'm afraid that if we get to December and they haven't updated anything, you're only going to get what we've done differently, but nothing from the state. Would you rather that we delay till January or go forward with the December? Really, for the so three of you. Would you delay? January. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the next one is um, at the January 11th board meeting, and we can talk about this actually in December, but um, the high school is looking to host. Um, kind of a new event and it's going to be called the future Islander event and it's going to be one where we're actually going to be inviting specific we'll invite all of our eighth grade families but in particular we're going to be reaching out to families who we believe still live on Mercer Island but have eighth graders or ninth graders or tenth graders and maybe thinking about coming back to Mercer Island and so they're going to host a night um, we've got robotics that night we've got wrestling that night um, Improv drama going that night, and then we're going to bring in others. And you're so going to invite them to our board meeting. Well, so this is the this is the fun part. If we start early enough, then we can go over and join them. Um, but we can talk more. Um, but I'm excited about this event. It's another opportunity that our schools are taking to, especially as families who have kids in private schools, they have to start making decisions by usually February 1st or February 15th or March 1st, and so. We're going to bring families in and see, um, give them a chance to see our high school, hear from our principal, um, and hear from others about um, what we're up to and, and why we might be a good choice for families again. So um, maybe looking for us to adjust the time just so I can get there too, and then any other board members who'd like to join. But um, I'll talk more about that in December, and that's, those are the announcements. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, let's move to ledger report. Um, so in looking at the um, WASDA priorities, you know, we talked last time just about kind of doing our own, and I have not done it yet. Um, and then also, it just feels a little funny with such a substantial change in the board to have current these current board members um, approving the priorities for a new board. So. What I plan to do is, I think, in looking at the collective priorities from WASDA, it's four of them, and I said this last time, but ample funding, special education, build safe and healthy schools, and then transport and feed students. And I feel like the first three um, are were aligned with, and I feel like the fourth one, I, I really feel like they, they kind of tried to bring in social emotional in the building safe and healthy schools, but I feel like it misses the mark. I really feel like with the mental health crises that our kids are going through, that needs to be called out, that, that our state should be supporting that more so than it is and, and should actually be part of the prototypical school model. So um, what I'm planning on doing is is kind of, you know, maybe doing some bullet points and adding um, adding some of our specific issues because I think that this and then there's the second page on what WASDA sends out is kind of the, the democratic process and I think that could be really helpful for our community to because people ask all the time how how can we help, help advocate it's like you know it's not about it, it's money right I mean if we had the money we could do more things so um, really try and empower our community to be advocating and we can do a bullet of you know increasing the levy funding and maintaining you know wh whether we call it regionalization or you know cost of living adjustments for staff or whatever um, 
what whatever just kind of hit the and then the special education i'm still waiting for there to be a class action lawsuit against the legislature because it's required by law that they fully cover special education <laughs> um there was talk about last year i'm going to follow up on that at was done. but anyway so that's kind of my plan here we are meeting with our state legislators in january i think assuming we are four people so early so i'm gonna get on that i but i didn't do it but I just wanted to give this really super quick update on the Wakayakum um, um, because the networking call was on that and I know um, there is going to be at least a session if not more about it at the WASDA conference and what was really interesting is you know it, it gets a little old being like listed as you know the wealthy district where you know the, the money doesn't impact or you know doesn't impact our citizens but but the example that they used, I think, really hit close to home for them to be able to like barely do the improvements that they need to do in some of these, like Wakaiakum at least, it would raise their property taxes like two hundred fifty dollars a month, um, and they wouldn't come. If that's for like thirty million dollars, so that's not even coming close to anything that they need to do. And their buildings are dangerous, and they've been declared dangerous, like seismic, like kids will die if there's an earthquake. Um, Fortunately, we're not there, um, but you know, for us, it's it's pennies on the dollar in terms of our monthly impact um, compared to them, pennies on the dollar. So, uh, you know, really getting, I, I, you know, they were saying in their advocacy, you know, we don't want to pit schools districts against districts, right? It's like, but when you use us as the example, it's not really, like what's effective would be, you know, Bellevue and Issaquah and Seattle that have the corporate tax structure that, that, you know, they're doing new schools every year. Each of those, they have a rotation and they do them every year. So I feel like we need to help guide them in their advocacy, like quit throwing us under the bus because we're gonna have the same trouble passing our bond. And the more that you say it's gonna be easy peasy. Now there's a lot of districts that should get more support from the state than we are, and that's fine, but, but it's, I think it's the wrong example. So just start thinking about it. Um, and then uh, I, I think that we're going to need to, I'm, I'm going to try and build some of those bullets into the build safe and healthy schools in terms of, in terms of some advocacy strategies for us, because like maybe we look at, you know, the big districts that have all that corporate tax structure and they have to share it. <laughs> like that's where all the money is. It's not the property taxes. Cause we don't, you know, they have a combo. We only have the property tax so anyways that's my Thank soapbox you. for today okay let's move to announcements and crews and reports Any announcements and crews and reports i attended uh the westmercer pack meeting which was extremely well run and efficient lasted one hour got everything done that was on the agenda i was very impressed um and got a little bit of a sneak preview of the westmercer um, school improvement plan. It's great. So. Um, what did I do? I attended the uh, All Island Band Night, which was super fun. It's just so fun to see all those little crazy kids running around. I mean, it was like 800 kids on the field, um, which is awesome. And then, and the band's just getting super excited for Macy's Day Parade and attended the Band Together auction and their Families are so excited to be, so many families are going. And um, there was something else that I did too. So, but always, but um, you know, hey, I just want, I mean, I know we'll have a chance to, to say our goodbyes, but just congratulations on your last full board meetings. Um, and uh, looking forward to seeing what the future brings. Thank you. Um, so I attended a Northwood pack, which had a preview of the school improvement plan that we went over today. And then, uh, like Deborah, was also at All Island Band Night as well as the band fundraiser. And I think you see uh, certainly a unique perspective into the bonds of community uh, in a group like the band program and how important it is and how some of those communities, I think, are quite unique to our island. Um, and it's uh, you know, a pleasure and we're fortunate to be part of it. Uh, no announcements are anything for me, so. Uh, with that, Tim, you didn't have a doubt. Uh, any, could I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor, students? Aye. Uh, 
Directors? Aye. 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 Against? And with that, uh, we are adjourned. 2050. There we go. Thank you.